Good evening. I am Trinae Srex, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6 p.m. on this 12th day of June, 2023. Thank you to those who have joined us in person and online. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the Holland Road Annex School Board Room is Chair Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Manning, Ms. Martin, Ms. Melnick, and Ms. Owens. Thank you. So please join me in observing a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, Madam Chair, we will begin our, our favorite part of the evening, and that's when we get to recognize students and um, staff for their outstanding accomplishments. Our first recognition is for the 2023 Outstanding Middle School Principal of Virginia. Please welcome Champrice Bevel. A panel of principals and superintendents representing the Principal Awards Committee of the Virginia Association of Secondary School Principals named Ms. Bevel the 2023 Outstanding Middle School Principal of Virginia. She has been principal at Bayside 6th grade campus since 2021. She has cultivated a welcoming, inclusive, and affirming environment with a clear vision that every student in her Title I school reads at or above proficiency and identifies a career or post-secondary interest. Recent data shows improvement in all categories of standards of learning tests, a reduction of 28% in discipline referrals, and improvement of attendance from 13th to 2nd among the division middle schools. The school has garnered recognition with the 2022 National ESEA Distinguished School and 2022 Purple Star Awards. Following input from student focus groups and staff, Ms. Bevel organized the school into smaller learning communities as a transition strategy from elementary school an instructional approach for individualization, and an early intervention process for behavior and attendance. Congratulations, Ms. Bevel. We're proud of you. Our next recognition are for schools who demonstrated exemplar performance to the Virginia Board of Education. Would the principals of those schools please come forward? For the 2022 and 2023 award year, 48 schools in the entire state met the criteria for the highest achievement award. Six of them are part of the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. To reach this designation, schools must be accredited and must meet state benchmarks in reading, math, and science. Schools winning the highest achievement award, Strawbridge Elementary, Principal Jacqueline Sargent, Old Donation School, Principal Joel Goldenshoe, Princess Anne Elementary, represented tonight by Assistant Principal James Dobb, Three Oaks Elementary, Principal Matt Orbaugh, Tallwood Elementary, Principal Lisa Souter, and North Landing Elementary, represented tonight by Assistant Principal Sheena Smith. Two of our high schools were recognized with continuous improvement awards for increasing their graduation and completion index and decreasing their dropout rate. Those schools are Bayside High, Principal Troy Walton, Green Run High, Principal Tennille Bowser, and two of our elementary schools were recognized with continuous improvement awards for increasing achievement in mathematics and reading 
for two or more student groups. Parkway Elementary, Principal Katie Catania, and White Oaks Elementary, Principal Kimani Vaughn. Finally, the Virginia Board of Education honors one school in each region with the Innovative Practice Award. Kempsville High School, represented today by Principal Melissa George, received this award for creating a cohesive, multi-pronged, school-wide plan to align student experiences with the Virginia Beach City Public Schools graduate profile. The plan ensures students are actively involved in setting post-high school goals, reflecting on relevant experiences, as well as building strong community members who serve the community through service learning projects. Congratulations to the students, the faculty, and staff of all these schools. We are very proud of you. Our next recognition is for the VHSL Class 5 State Baseball Champions, Cox High School. Come forward. Yay! The 2023 Cox High School baseball team won the Region 5A Baseball Championship and went on to win the VHSL Class 5 Championship. This team had a motto, 20 plus 6. And I didn't really know what that meant, so I called one of the assistant coaches, and I'm like, what does that mean? What that meant was let's get 20 games in the regular season, that will put us in the playoffs, and there's six games you have to win in the playoffs to win the state championship. So they did it. They got all six of those games. They had a gauntlet of a regular season and overcame three tough losses to get to the plus six side. In the playoffs, they beat a nationally ranked team in the finals. Um, Cox High School has won the state championship two out of the last three years, and in 2021, it was the first time a beach school won the state championship since 2005. And there was a guy named Beamer Weems on the 2005 team. <laughs> so this is great to be able to spread the Virginia Beach love. The team is led by seniors Riley DeCandido, Michael Irby, Joe Mutinitz, Aiden Isanya, and Tyler Frostad. Additional team members are William Ashman, Michael Barrero, Jake Colucci, Ryan DeLashmut, Christian Dewey, John Mack Dye, Aiden and Sonia, Blake Hasilius, Austin Irby, Joseph Munitz, Lewis Schultz, Brendan White, Dylan Whitmire, Connor Worth, Taylor Adams, Daniel Barrero, Martin Lemke, John Lambert, Braden Lyons, Alex John, Ethan Reno, Elliot Varner, Aidan Doherty, and Charles Faison. Some of these guys will be representing Virginia Beach in college, and they include Lynchburg College, University of Maryland, East Carolina, and Liberty. Good luck to y'all next year. The coach is Matt Itner, and the assistant coaches are Zach Hines, Ross Cardwell, TJ Bardike, Mike DeJager, Ryan Piston, Grayson Bailey, Tyler Rasmussen, Pat Wernig. Congratulations, Cox. We are very proud of you. Way to go. Our, rec our next recognition is for the VHSL Class 6 Boys Soccer State Champions. Will the Knights of Kellum High School please come forward? With a record of 21 and 0, giving up just six goals all season, the 2023 Kellum Boys Soccer Team are your Class 6. VHSL state champions. They are the first ever boys soccer team in Kellum history to win a state championship. And the team members are Davis Funk, 
William Stanley, Matthew Yates, Elijah Perry, Walker Kiernan, Colton Lutz, Samuel Brown, Joshua Nevins, Marcus Ariano, Andrew Campbell, Leonardo Fajardo, Tristan Kidd, Hamilton Howells, Samuel, Samuel Riccardella, Charles Dennison, Hunter Roche, Jackson Turner, Colby Atkins, John Maggio, Aiden Cass, Cameron Talbert, Carson Strutz, Landon Imbrogno, Jayshawn Johnson, Caleb Perry, and Gil DeVera. The head coach is Craig Powers. The assistant coaches are Alex Assertion, Vossit Lighty, and Jordan Grumney. Congratulations, Kellum. We are proud of you. And Madam Chair, this concludes the school board recognitions for this evening. Now we are going to have the adoption of the agenda. There will be some modifications to the agenda. First, the ad hoc committee to study open space uses for school property on Jericho Road is on the information agenda. And I want to also add that the ad hoc committee to study open space uses for school property on Jericho Road to action uh, for voting tonight as well. This will be on agenda item 15E. Also, we are amending the agenda under 15B to 15B1, Bylaw 128, regarding the Policy Review Committee, and 15B2, School Board Committee, the assignment for the fiscal year 2024. Do I have a Motion, a second for that motion. Okay. Ms. Melnick, is there any discussion? Ms. Uh, Manning. So I just learned about the addition of um, this bylaw being put on our agenda. It hasn't even been on for information. Um, do our bylaws require that um, it go on for information first? It does require, bylaw 130 requires on information, so I think it, she was moving to put it on information and then inform you that she was probably going to ask you to do it for action, so it, it was supposed to be on for information. Okay, so <clears throat> we just learned of this today, so I, I assume that the public hasn't had a chance to look at those changes that have been proposed. They were just emailed to us by our attorney a few hours ago, so I haven't even had a chance to look at them in detail, and I don't think it's appropriate for us to vote on a bylaw change the you know minutes before it's been presented to the board, and the public hasn't even had a chance to take a look at it. Um, so for that reason, I'm not going to be able to support um, amending the agenda to add that. Thank you. It's going to be added to information first, and it will be under um, C. It'll be D. It'll be D. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. So we've got C um, still as this open space used for school property on Jericho Road, and then D will be the bylaw. Bylaw by law 128. Yes. Both under information. Any other discussion? Okay, so I have a motion and a second, uh, and we've discussed it. Um, all that are in favor of this amendment and this uh, presentation of the agenda, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have eight ayes. 
All that are against this amendment or this agenda, please raise your hand. And we have three nays. The amended agenda did pass. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go to the superintendent's report. This is our second monthly meeting and his recognitions as well. Um, Dr. Spence, we look forward to your report and your recognitions. Thank you. And good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. Here are just a few items of interest for you and our families to know this evening. First, more than 4,500 VBCPS students graduated in 2023, and they were a class like no other. Our graduation ceremonies earlier this month celebrated the many achievements of our students. Consider, for example, these statistics. As of June 16th, the total scholarships offered to our students is $97.9 million. This class accepted around $62 million in scholarships, which continues a three-year upward trend. Of our 4,579 graduates, 2,602 of them received the Virginia Department of Education Diploma Seal for exemplary performance. When we asked our students of their plans after graduation, 2,675 said they will attend a four-year college, 880 will pursue a two-year degree, 196 will enroll in an apprenticeship business or trade school, 156 are enlisting in the military, and 424 will be entering the workforce. Our graduates include an incredible array of talented students, including an Ocean Lake student who recently helped surgery patients in India as a part of his ongoing work with Operation Smile, a Lansdowne High School student who earned his pilot's license this month, and nearly 20 Green Run seniors who recently completed two-week internships at 16 businesses in Hampton Roads, including the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters, the Naval History Museum, and the Virginia State Company. We are proud of all of our graduates, and I know we'll hear more about their contributions to our community and to our world. Next, on June 9th, students from Parkway Elementary and Green Run Elementary School celebrated a great year with their mentors at the Virginia Beach Law Enforcement Academy. The lead mentor, Judge Tim Quick, recognized the students and their mentors at this graduation event. Thanks to the Virginia Beach Bar Association, the Sheriff's Department, the Police Department, and Dr. Robertson for participating in this program. It's a great example of our Compass to 2025 strategic framework, which encourages us to seek mutually beneficial partnerships amongst families, schools, civic and city agencies to support student well-being, enhance real-world real learning, and broaden opportunities for career exploration and experiences. Earlier this month, more than 150 students from our Title I schools participated in the Oceans of Success field trip at the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center as a reward for improving their academic performance this school year. Students met a skink named Godzilla and a crow named Russell. They watched turtles, sharks, and other marine life swim and dive around them while learning about the ecosystems in the Chesapeake Bay. We want to thank the Aquarium and retired Chief Justice Thomas Shadrick and uh, Breit Bianazon, trial lawyers, for helping make this event happen, along with all of the staff and volunteer chaperones. Also, at a recent luncheon, Virginia Beach City Public Schools thanked its more than 550 custodial staff members for keeping our schools clean and being pillars of our community. There was a lot of laughter as these valued professionals enjoyed a meal and received a few small gifts of appreciation for all they do for our schools. Our Director of Custodial and Distribution Services, Sammy Nix, can be seen here shaking the hand of every single person who was there and made sure that they know that not a day goes by without us feeling thankful for what they contribute to VBCPS. Next, congratulations to our Department of Communications and Community Engagement for receiving multiple awards from the National School Public Relations Association. The Office of Family and Community Engagement received a Gold Achievement Award for their Empowering Family Voice Groups. Our web designers were recognized for the relaunch of vbschools.com. We were also recognized for our holiday video to families and the What Is Your Why video, which we presented at last year's leadership conference. Many of the stories we've been sharing on social media were also awarded, including the piece we did on the Happy Day Cafe. So we want to send a thank you to our DCCE team for helping us spread the many positive things going on here in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. We're also excited about several events coming up this week and later this summer. For, for example, tomorrow, June 28th, is the annual golf tournament at Heron Ridge Golf Club that supports learning enrichment programs through the Virginia Beach Education Foundation. 
You can visit vbef.org for more information about the Foundation's work. On Friday, June the 30th, we'll be hosting a retirement celebration here at the Holland Road Annex. And spread the word, the Back to School Care Fair will be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday, August the 12th at a new location, the Virginia Beach Convention Center. As always, this event is free and open to the public and will include backpack giveaways, haircuts, physicals, vision, dental, and hearing screenings, along with information from over 150 community partners. Thanks to our Office of Family and Community Engagement for organizing this event every year. Again, that will be August 12th at the Convention Center. So that concludes my report, but now I'd like to move on to recognitions. First, I'd like to um, ask Nicole Stanley to please stand up. Mrs. Stanley has served as a gym director. She has been a physical education assistant here in, in Fairfield Elementary School, a physical education assistant at Bayside Elementary School, a teacher at Tallwood Elementary School, and most recently has been serving as administrative assistant at Point of View Elementary School. And we're pleased that you accepted our recommendation at your last meeting for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Point of View Elementary School. Congratulations to you. And could you, uh, could you please introduce your guest to us? You may have to use your outside voice. Very nice, thank you. If I could ask Amy Wetmore to please stand up. Amy has served with distinction both as a teacher in Richland County, uh, South Carolina, as well as here at Ocean Lakes Elementary School. She's also been at Pembroke Elementary School. She was a math coach at Corporate Landing in Malibu Elementary School. Most recently has been serving as an administrative assistant at Pembroke Elementary School. And we are pleased that at your last meeting you accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Pembroke Elementary School. Congratulations to you. And please introduce us to your guests. Congratulations again. Next, if I could ask Andy Flipowitz to please stand up. Mr. Flipowitz has served in Virginia Beach since 2006 as a teacher at Ocean Lakes High School, a teacher leader in the Center for Teacher Leadership, a school improvement specialist at Independence Middle School, an assistant principal at Independence, and also an assistant principal most recently at Kellum High School. We're pleased that at your last meeting you accepted our recommendation for Mr. Flipwitz to serve as the next principal of Princess Anne Middle School. Congratulations. <laughs> you also have guests. Could you please introduce them? Thank you, and congratulations again. And then finally, if I could ask Carrie Manugo to please stand up. Mr. Manugo has served since 1995 in Virginia Beach as a teacher at Bayside High School, an administrative assistant at Kellum High School, an assistant principal at Kempsville High School. He's been a principal of Independence Middle School and principal of Larkspur Middle School uh, most recently, and we are pleased you have accepted our recommendation for him at your last meeting to serve as the next principal of Salem High School. Congratulations, Mr. Manugo. And I know you have some guests with you as well. <laughs> Thank you again, and Madam Chair, that concludes my report and recognitions. Thank you, and congratulations to all of you. So next we are on the approval of our meeting minutes. There are two sets of meeting minutes to approve tonight. The first is the June 6, 2023 Special School Board Meeting. Are there any modifications to the June 6, 2023 Special School Board Meeting Minutes as presented? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the June 6 Minutes as presented. 
So moved and seconded by Ms. Weems. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, I call for a vote to approve the June 6, 2023 minutes as presented. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. Thank you. Oh, I need for any um, votes against it or either um, abstentions. Yes, Mr. And Callen. we have one abstention. And that's because? I was not in attendance to that meeting. Thank you, Mr. Callan. So, Madam Chair, uh, the motion passed with 10 ayes and one abstention. Thank you. Next is our June 12th, 2023 regular school board meeting. Are there any modifications to the June 12th, 2023 regular school board meeting minutes as presented? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the June 12th, 2023 minutes as so presented. Moved. Ms. Um, Anderson and seconded by Mr. Callan. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, I call for a vote to approve the June 12th, 2023 minutes as presented. All in favor, please raise your hands. It's just me up my hand. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. We are now to number 11, our public comments, and we will ha uh, hear them until 8 p.m. And the school board will now hear public comments on matters relevant to pre-K public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. The purpose for the public comment section of the school board agenda is for the school board to offer an orderly forum to receive public comments during the school board meeting. Members of the public have the opportunity to provide comments during the meeting by signing up to speak from the podium. Other methods of public comment are not offered during the school board meeting. As a reminder, to persons in attendance at tonight's meeting, school board meeting decorum guidelines prohibit disruption of the meeting through clapping, calling by audience members, holding signs that interfere with audience members' ability to view the meeting, or otherwise taking action to communicate with the school board or disrupt the meeting. Speakers are responsible for being in the school board room or auditorium on, or online when they are called to speak, and when a person Name, speaker's name is called. The speaker should line up at the aisle to wait for their turn at the podium. Speakers lined up for their turn at the podium may take a seat near the podium to wait for their turn to speak. If a speaker is not present when called to speak or is not online or unable to unmute when called to speak, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of this public comment session. The school board also invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. Madam Clerk, please announce the first speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first student speaker will be Adeline Bohan. Good evening. I remember back in September when the draft version of Glenn Youngkin's model policies were released. I remember it well because we talked about it in my eighth grade civics class. We had only been in school for a few weeks and we were just getting back into the group of school. I have many friends who identify as trans, gay, and other things. As you can imagine, we all had different opinions and thoughts about the topic. It was good to have a dialogue and to see different viewpoints. I was able to see things from the perspective of my gay and trans friends. To be clear, I and the rest of the students and parents on my side do not hate or, or discriminate against gay or trans students. In fact, I care about and love my friends who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. I want them to be happy at school and everywhere they go and in everything they do. Since that civics class period, I have watched many of the school board meetings and I've listened to the students and the adults who are worried about the new model policies. I don't want them to worry, but I also have a few worries of my own. In middle school, my trans friends still ended up going to the bathroom of their biological sex. However, this fall, I'll be in high school, and I worry that there may be biological males in the girls' bathroom. Will I be protected? How will I be protected? What are the protections for students of different faiths who are called horrible, untrue names for having our own convictions and values that may not align with other students? Will we be protected? 
It seems like there has been a one-sided focus on a particular group of students in the school system, and that worries me. Of course, I care about my friends in the LGBTQ plus community. I'm friends with them. We get along very well. Our differences are healthy. But there's so much division over this, I worry that the resolution may end up creating more division. What will happen when the new model policies are released? Will new policies be written to protect all students? That should be the focus of the school board, to protect all students. It shouldn't be as difficult as you're making it to be. So when the new po model policies come out, I want you to have the entire student body in mind as you make, the, make new policies. Every student counts, even the ones that aren't categorized as a minority. Thank you. Our next speakers are Dr. Todd Gaffey, Lindsay Bohan, and then Becky Hay. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, members of the school board. My name is Dr. Todd Gacky. I serve as the Vice President of Government Relations for the Family Foundation located in Richmond, Virginia, an organization representing thousands of parents across the state dedicated to advocating family values and parental rights. I'm here today to speak to the issue of parental rights and the well-being of students in public schools. There are simply matters that are too heavy for a young child or adolescent to bear. Corrington Boone, the author of The Hiding Place, uh, recalls this lesson that she learned. While on a train with her father, she recalls a conversation she had with him in which she asked him, what is sex sin, loosely translated sexual experience or sexuality? Instead of giving her a verbal response, he took his suitcase, laid it on the ground, and asked her to pick it up. When she couldn't, because it was way too heavy, he said to her, some knowledge is too heavy for children. When you are older and stronger, you can bear it. For now, you must trust me to carry it for you. That is the role of a parent, not the school or government subdivisions. Virginia Code Section 1-240 states that a parent has a fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education, and care of their parent's child. Virginia regulations provide that no student is allowed to participate in any counseling program to which the student's parents object. Virginia Code Section 22.1-16 says that parents must be notified and given the chance to opt out of any instructional material that includes sexually explicit material. And the courts have made the primacy of parental rights abundantly clear. Troxel v. Granville, the liberty interest of parents in the care, custody, and control of their children is perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by the court. Parham v. J.R. in 1979, simply because the decision of a parent is not agreeable to a child or because it involves risks, does not automatically transfer the power to make that decision from the parents to some agency or officer of the state. It went on to say that most children, even in adolescence, simply are not able to make sound judgments concerning many decisions. It is vital, therefore, for the school board, along with parents, the adults, to agree on policies that do not facilitate a child's denial of biological reality and send them down the path of irreversible bodily seconds. harm, which all begins with social transitioning. That is why we are urging the board to adopt in its entirety the 2022 revised model policies on the privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents in public schools and when they are finalized soon. Let the parents parent and let them carry the burdens of their children. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this important topic. Our next speaker is Lindsay Bohan, Becky Hay, and then Rob Bohan. Good evening. For months, we've heard hypothetic, hypothetical stories about what may happen under Glenn Youngkin's model policies, but tonight you will hear two real stories that are a direct consequence of policies like those currently in place from Northam's term as governor. Michelle Blair's story will hit especially close to home as she is from Virginia and under Northam's policies. I am speaking tonight to add my voice to the many parents and, and concerned citizens regarding the dismantling of parental rights. For months, we have heard a one-sided perspective and I am very concerned with the current atmosphere you have created. In what should be a collaborative effort between board members with varying ideas, 
backgrounds and experiences, it has been reduced to a rubber stamp political party line vote. As a result, we are witnessing the progression of ideologies that aim to remove rights and transparency and replace them with overreach and control. We are supposed to be doing a great work together, but we as parents are being edged out one policy at a time. We have seen many parents and community members come to defend parental rights and advocate for fair treatment of all students, but even this is seen as divisive. You need to realize the dangerous game you, you are playing when you seek to belittle and damage the relationship between parents and their children. Students are in the school system for a few short years, but we are their parents forever. Every effort should be made to build and fortify family relationships. These policies intentionally cut parents out and seem to be part of an overall progression where school boards, like this majority, are pushing policies and becoming further entrenched in this pattern of legitimizing lying to parents. As a former teacher, I can tell you that these policies put teachers in a terrible position, forcing them to lie to kids, hide things from their parents regarding their children, and driving wedges between parents and their children by creating an environment where children feel they need to pick sides. They're activist teachers who only have an ideological investment, or their parents who have the fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education, and care for their children. This is an incredibly unfair burden to place on teachers, especially those who do not agree with or who feel uncomfortable with the policies like 30 this. seconds. This can only lead to a lasting and potentially devastating um, effect on children and families. We are calling on this school board to work together to realign existing policies found in 5-7.1 with the forthcoming model policies, which will restore the emphasis on parental rights and involvement. Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Hay, Rob Bohan, and then Brenda Pence. Tonight I'm calling on this board to know your role. Since the dawn of time, parents have nurtured, nourished, guided, and educated their children. Over time, schools came alongside parents to partner with them in education to ensure well-rounded citizens who could contribute positively to, to society. However, parents have always been and will continue to be the primary decision makers in their children's lives. This includes all matters related to gender identity. Parents are foundational to the safety and development of children and values are taught at home. All families, despite worldview or political ideology, should be respected by the school and its representatives. The parent-child relationship should be guarded and affirmed, and parents should always be involved in any discussion regarding the mental and physical health of their children. Information should never be kept from a parent, and transparency is critical in the protection of all students. Shutting parents out of the discussion is the school usurping the role and responsibility of parents, and it puts all students in danger. Tonight, I'm honored to stand with two families who have important stories to share regarding the real harm of the transgender movement and of school policies that cut parents out of the gender identity discussion. This board has dismissed important perspectives of individuals and families such as Chloe Cole and Michelle Blair. Our schools must protect the privacy, physical safety, and emotional health of all students. And this is possible for all students, even those gen wrestling with gender identity issues. But transparency is required and parents should be the drivers of these serious and potentially life-altering decisions. This board must take action to remove policies that contribute to the harm of our students and the parent-child re re relationship, such as policy 5-7.1, treatment of transgender students. In addition, our school district policies must unequivocally align with Governor Youngkin's model policies when they are finalized this summer. Governor Youngkin's policies will prohibit schools from hiding student information from parents, including information related to gender. And his policies affirm the constitutional rights of parents to instill in and nurture the values and beliefs of their children. Despite the weak, symbolic attempt of this board to appease misguided children, propping them up in the name of inclusion to pass a resolution seeking to undermine pending VDOE policy, this fight is not over. It will never be over because we are parents and we will always protect our kids. The overwhelming majority of parents will not abdicate their role or responsibility due to passing ideology or intimidation. 
They have always been and will always be our children, not the schools. Schools have no right to exclude parents and they have no right to put students in a position that may cause harm. Know your role, focus on strong academics and leave the social and political elements to parents. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rob Bohan, Brenda Pence, and then Michelle Blair. Good evening, school board. I wanted to check in and see how everyone is feeling about this past year and what uh, you think you've accomplished. I have a few observations uh, about topics that seem to have monopolized our time here. Students have been attending in record numbers, with the exception of this week, um, sharing stories and feelings about LGBTQ issues. Uh, their comments have ranged from honest feelings that many students in and out of the LGBTQ community have to attacks with verbiage that amounts to holding your positions and votes hostage with phrases like, if you don't do this or that, children will die. Accompanying those veiled threats, or accompanying those with veiled threats from parents and adults of ruining people's reputations and livelihoods by just having a different opinion. It took until the last week of school for something to pass, and what was it? A pointless, virtue signaling political stunt that you call a resolution. Shame on you for toying with the emotions and fears of these students. Months ago, you could have addressed this by acknowledging and highlighting VBCPS's current policies and protections that are already in place, specifically former Governor Northam's policies and the current non-discrimination policies. Obviously, any new, any new policy will be discussed as it arises, like from our new governor, but that was nowhere in sight. Your politics were proud, on proud display with no regard to the students and communities that you were supposed to be representing. They were your pawns to play and you played them. That resolution did and continues to do nothing. You wanna work with parents to do great work together, but how can we work together when you, freely, when you are freely open to withholding information from parents? Your policies facilitate and encourage teachers, staff, and administration to hide student information from their parents. You have been uh, presented with graphic, vulgar, and highly sexualized material that is inside your schools, and yet you do nothing about it. You defer to your librarians, who repeatedly have told us that they do not know what's in their libraries, it is impossible to know what is in their libraries, and they won't be able to do their job as librarians if they have to figure out what is inside their libraries. Why is that not even a, a concern of yours? Your focus of student first has drifted off course into politics and you're leaving students in your wake. 30% of students in grades three through nine are below uh, level with reading. That's almost 22,000 children that are struggling to read. And maybe it doesn't matter what's in the libraries because they probably can't read what's on the shelf. I am just one parent talking to you right now, but these policies apply to each student, parent, and guardian. 30 seconds. You are okay with withholding and hiding information from each and every person in this building. You are okay with putting graphic and lewd and highly sexualized books in the face of every student in this district because they are in your libraries. And you are okay with using student voices to bolster your political ideology. If this, uh, is this the course that you are continuing to chart for our children? Our next speaker is Brenda Pence, Michelle Blair, then Chloe Cole. Good evening, I'm Brenda Pence and a retired school teacher here in Virginia Beach and concerned citizen. In the great scheme of the American hierarchy of self-government, the local school boards made up of elected officials are unfortunately the least known by its voting constituents. Your lives, educational achievements, political persuasions are seldom exposed as compared to the election of our delegates, governors, and presidents. Yet you hold the most important election, elected position in our culture. 11 Virginia Beach citizens determine the entire educational philosophy and curricula of our public schools. You make policies and decisions affecting every child and every family in Virginia Beach. It's a lot of power and with apparently very little accountability. You have recently demonstrated respect and a listening ear to our students but where are your listening ears and respect for parents, the ones who elect you and pay your salaries? Why have the parents been the last to speak in your presence? Why are you, seeking parent, why are you not seeking parents for your advisory board with the same openness and enthusiasm you have for the students? Are parents just in the way? What is your real agenda? agenda? We have questions and we hold you accountable. 
So tell us why you didn't vote unanimously to protect young children from graphic sexual materials kept in, in the elementary school libraries. Then explain why you didn't vote unanimously to keep biological boys raging with hormones out of biological girls' lockers and bathrooms. And can you tell these parents why it's necessary to have a non-discrimination resolution, resolution for their transgender child and not their special needs child? Can you explain why you think it's better for parents to have less parental rights, less parental involvement, less knowledge of issues affecting their children? Even though research overwhelmingly shows parental involvement is a major key in student success. Can you justify your votes? I don't think so, because there is no viable excuse for what you have done to systematically strip away the rights of parents to direct their children's education, social emotional development, 30 seconds. and issues of faith. Turn this board around and actively fight for the rights of parents. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle Blair, Chloe Cole, and then Stacy Abbott. I am Michelle Blair. I am the mother and grandmother of Sage Blair. Sage is now 16 and she is a survivor of sex trafficking. Hers is a tragic story and it is a miracle that she is alive. I am grateful that God was in the details. When Sage was 13 years old, she began to question who she was. Puberty and COVID hit hard and her mental health began to decline. I thought I had a handle on it until she began her first day of ninth grade at Appomattox High School. Sage decided to identify as a boy only because she thought the attention would help her find friends. Instead, the attention she received greatly harmed her due to the actions of the staff. It breaks my heart to realize that what happened to my daughter could easily have been avoided. Had her school simply been honest with me, instead they encouraged her boy identity and kept it a secret from me. They taught my daughter to break the one rule I taught her, do not lie to me. Instead, they taught my daughter how to lie. These schools lie by omission, by not advising me that they were calling my daughter by a boy's name. Why was I not informed by the school that my daughter was in danger due to her new gender identity? Tragic. They just never told me she was horribly bullied. They told me the day she decided to run away because she felt unsafe at school. My beautiful sage ran right into the hands of a sex trafficking ring. At only 14 years old, my daughter lost her innocence. Sage was gone 344 days. She is now home and working through severe trauma with a therapist who was honest with me. And recently I asked Sage what she would want other kids to know about her experience. Sage said, the reason why getting groomed, kidnapped, isn't fun. You will get tortured, mentally and physically. You could potentially be killed if you don't want to kill yourself by then. Groomers don't care about you. They will hurt you. Schools need to communicate with parents. There is absolutely no way that any school staff knows our child better than a parent. We love our children. We must seek to keep the family unit together with professional support when necessary. How many children are out there lost in a transgender cult? They're lost to a glitter family or in the hands, like Sage, of a sex trafficker. And did you know trans children sell for a higher price on the market than other children? So schools need to involve the, uh, us, the parents. Had my daughter's school seconds. failed, it, had my daughter's school involved me, the mother, Sage would not be paying the price for their failure to communicate with me. I was a mom whose top priority was safety of my daughter, yet she slipped through the cracks because of a school's decision to keep me in the dark, a decision that almost killed my daughter. We must be the voice of reason for our children. We must save our children before it's too late. To lose one child to the fate that Sage suffered is too much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chloe Cole, then Stacy Abbott, then David Cutchins. Hello, my name is Chloe Cole, and I've come to speak to you today because it is clear that you've been by, blended by ideology. You have allowed a political theory to come between you and the children you were trusted with protecting. My life has been destroyed by people like you who lie to children by telling them that they can change gender because it is separate from their biological sex. For me, 
My transition started when I was just 12 years old after being exposed to the idea that I could escape teenage awkwardness and the discomfort of growing from a girl into a woman by becoming a boy. At 13, I was put on the first irreversible intervention, which was puberty blockers, and then cross-sex hormones. This completely threw off my natural development and artificially induced a state of menopause. Imagine trying to go to, through, through middle school with hot flashes and itching and a pseudo-male puberty that a female body naturally fights against. It was miserable. My doctors held my parents hostage with the suicide myth that they handled with a weapon, like a weapon. Would you rather have a dead daughter or a living son was the question that they used to coerce my parents into allowing me to destroy my life. At 15, my breasts were taken from me. I once was sexually assaulted at school. My breasts were groping glass and nobody either saw or cared. I hated them and I wanted them gone. My doctors only ever said yes and they never pressed any further. I was affirmed in spite of my distress. I came to realize I was lied to at 16. My womanhood was taken from me before my, my 18th birthday. You are endangering children by perpetuating these lies, telling them that they can play God and that you will play along with them. It's evil. Most of you go along with it because you're afraid of being called names. What is keeping you from standing up? Do you really have less courage than me, an 18-year-old girl? Are you really going to wait until the government is ripping your son or daughter from your arms like they are doing in California? You have to pick which side you stand on. After all, it's the school's responsibility to foster a proper learning environment, and children cannot learn when they are under immense stress. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stacy. I need to remind you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stacy Abbott, David Cutchins, and then Diane Heron. Hello. As you all know, I came in here by accident the last school board meeting just to talk about fentanyl crisis and then saw what you guys spent so much time talking about. Um, I've emailed with you guys plenty of times. It seems like no one really cares about the fentanyl problem. I know that you are going to provide Narcan into the schools, even though no one's overdosing in the schools. They're getting it from each other and then going to parties at, on the weekend. Dr. Spence, you shook my, my son's hand right before he overdosed while he was high on the stage. And he only went to school probably about three months that year, and y'all still graduated him. And then you brag about how y'all graduate, your graduation rate. The, the kid that gave him the fentanyl, they didn't go to school, and they all graduated. I wouldn't brag about that. They can barely write sentences, and they graduated high school. They have no education. If you want to fix the fentanyl, which none of you seem like you do, or the drug problem, because 17, 18 year old, 19 year olds, they don't usually overdose in, in, since the last few years. You have to do more than just put Narcan in the schools. You have to have a program to warn these kids because there's kids being dropped off at doors overdosing. It's ridiculous. My kid met these kids in y'all school. Could have just sent my kid to a different school. I was told I had no rights also when I went to the school worried why he stopped coming to school. My daughter, when she was in fourth grade, a boy followed her in the bathroom. That's why this does mean a lot to me. A boy that wore a tutu and was her friend said he had a secret, he wanted to kiss her. My daughter, nothing, nobody cared. Nobody did anything, because the teachers don't know how to handle that because of y'all's political stuff that you're pushing on kids. You got kids in fourth and fifth grade talking about gay every single day. My daughter had a sleepover yesterday. The little girl, when we were pulling up to Wawa, was like, oh, there's a cop. Well, he looks like a good cop, because he looks like he might be gay. You're pushing sexual orientations on children. And a lot of it is because you couldn't stop being political because you, Dr. Spence, shouldn't have been writing stuff on your social media about a president. It started with you. And then the other ones, it's ridiculous. You're a school board. seconds. Every parent that I've spoken to at the graduations, and I know a lot, hate to break it to all of you, they don't have time to be here. They didn't even know this was happening, and they're floored. But I will let them know, and they will take the time out. And I don't think you guys will change anything. I think you just have to be voted off. 
you're not going to change anything. You're going to do the same thing you've been doing because that's what you've been doing. You'll just be voted off. And that is time. Our next speaker is David Cutchins, then Diane Heron, then Ginger Sherrick. Good evening, board members. My comments this evening are directed to the six of you who passed the so-called non-discrimination resolution at your last meeting. I say so-called because the gender identity policies that you currently have in place and are advocating to keep in place do in fact discriminate against every student, teacher, parent, and Virginia Beach community member who knows God's truth that we are each created by him as a man or a woman. So. You have heard and reacted to the thoughts and feelings of a small number of confused and anxious adolescents and some of their parents. Now, what about the rest of us? The rest of your students, your parents and grandparents, the taxpaying citizens of your community. We have been here too, if not as consistently as that pocket of students. We are here tonight trying to make sure that you hear and react to our voices as well and to be sure you know the rest of the story. You are hearing tonight about some of the tragic consequences of selling the false idol of gender identity to our children and of the real harm of government policies that support that religion. Yes, our children get confused and anxious in their adolescent search for identity. We know that, we have always known that. I dare say all of us experienced that to some degree when we were that age. In this era of social media, where they are being told that anything goes and they get to, that is they have to decide for themselves what they are and who they are without boundaries, the confusion and anxiety is clearly accelerated and deepened. I think we can all agree this is a very harmful environment for today's kids. In this context, the school environment that encourages this chaos in the heart of a child, while at the same time separating the parent from the child is irresponsible and abusive. School policy should be designed to help, not harm the family. It is time to take action to clean up harmful policies that create these problems. We believe that the policy revisions soon to come from the Virginia Department of Education will provide you with a good roadmap for accomplishing this. Virginia Beach school policies should protect every kid. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diane Heron, then Ginger Sherrick, then Russell Sherrick. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm a grandmom and a national board certified public school teacher in adolescent science. A teacher's major responsibility is that every student is considered individually in lesson preparations, but those plans are never dependent on students to implement for us. The individualized plans for physical, mental, emotional, and even attention needs are reached after extensive evaluation, testing, and counseling. In my 40 years, parental input was one of the most valuable resources that a teacher has. We would not be meeting the needs of the individual student to circumvent parents. Yes, working out a plan can be difficult, but it is vital to the well-being of the student, especially in transgender students who when listened to and guided with responsible loving adults, especially parents, have an 85 to 90% return rate to their biological sex. The wrong diagnosis done too quickly can box a student into an identity that does not serve them well and can even cause great harm, as you have heard. In the middle school years, there's a huge need to belong and be accepted misguided policies that universalize transgender individualized plans force all students to accept a lifestyle that is atypical during this age and phase. There is an innate need in the adolescent years for privacy and space and room to steer around these issues as they develop. If we inject the confusion of transsexuality into these private spaces, such as bathrooms and locker rooms that are necessary developmentally to these young people, then we are asking them to try to navigate a universal plan that affects their development negatively. Surely these are not the best practices for our children. 
No other IEP or individualized education plan, whether formal or not, for any needs in our schools depends on burdening our children to implement it in their private spaces, nor should it ever. We should never box students into early permanent labels, especially sexual identity. Give them quality testing and counseling with parent awareness, yes. Freedom from bullies, yes. Great classroom teaching, 30 seconds. especially yes. Separate facilities as needed in their situation, sure. A concrete sexual identity apart from parental consent before 18, absolutely not. I have had wheelchair-bound students who needed a separate bathroom. I was not wheelchair-phobic or bigoted. It was simply the best plan in our school with our facilities for everyone. We are called to protect all that of is our time. children at the same time. Our next speaker is Ginger Sherrick, then Russell Sherrick, then Richard Pickens. Good evening. <clears throat> First, on behalf of my family and my community, my heartfelt thanks to Chloe and Michelle for their courage in speaking up. My husband and I have three adult children, two, two of whom graduated from Salem High School. Over time, for 20 plus years, I was a parent volunteer in their schools while my husband served this country in the Marine Corps. The last 12 plus years, I volunteered were here in Virginia Beach, and several of those years were at Salem High School when Dr. Robertson was the principal. Congratulations, Dr. Robertson, on your accomplishments. I remember how rough adolescence was, in particular, for our two girls. Heck, I still remember my adolescence. In those days, the term bullying was not used. I was either picked on or teased. As our kids became adults, they have shared stories of some of the things that they did in adolescence, knowing that they would have been disciplined or gotten in trouble if we had known. Typical teenage immature decisions. I know that being involved as a parent and forming relationships with their teachers and the school staff helped our children navigate those difficult years. I thank God that they are now law-abiding productive members of society. I am asking you to revisit your decisions and restore parental rights. Adolescence today is still a difficult journey, but now immature decisions can be more life-threatening. All parents must have a voice in the safety and well-being of their children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Russell Sherrick, then Richard Pickens, then Ann Pickens. Good evening, and thank you for allowing this opportunity. I will be short and sweet because this is about accountability. As a former Marine officer, I was held accountable for accomplishing the mission and taking care of my troops. You, as a school board, are accountable for the education and safety of the students within this Virginia Beach school system. I can tell you from experience as a young lieutenant at the time, what it felt like to write a letter home to a parent, a parent, because my Marine was going home in a box. Are you accountable? Are you accountable for p stories like we heard tonight? Ask yourself if you've got the moral courage to stand up and approve Governor Yunkin's proposed guidelines. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Pickens, Ann Pickens, and then Mara Engelbert. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. I can't be silent. It is evil to circumvent the rights of parents. It is evil to withhold information from them while keeping secrets between you and their children. It is evil for you to maintain harmful pornography in the school libraries. And I see Pride Month and pornographic literature as all a part of social transitioning. According to the Family Foundation, children suffer when they're pushed down a transitioning path 
by adult activist agendas. In Canada, parents now face the threat of five years in prison if they provide lifestyle change and guidance for their sexually confused child and they cannot even leave the country if they're planning on convincing them to be heterosexual. In California, there's a bill AB665 that eliminates parental consent for mental health counseling and now they're permitting 12 year olds to make decisions about their own mental health treatments. They can get counseling, they can get treatment, they can get medication without parental involvement and he can even leave home and go to a shelter. No abuse need be found. What could possibly go wrong? From libraries filled with rainbow displays containing inappropriate materials and pornography read in this very room, evil has made its presence known. From Boston's Children's Hospital offering barbaric surgeries for kids, evil has made its presence known. From the White House where the rainbow flag was recently displayed at all, and then inappropriately between and on the same level as the American flag, while transgender men flaunted their latest boob job, we're being called upon to stand up to evil every day. This is evil, and we will not call it good. Christians have a 2,000-year history of helping people overcome sexual identity issues. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, a famous preacher states, and that is what some of you were. God does, God will help and change people. Parents are being put in horrific situations in which only one response seems to be promoted. Your daughter comes to you wanting to change your biological sex, which is impossible, and she asks, would you rather have a live son or a dead daughter? A live son is the expected reply, but there's a better answer. I would lean in and say, I already have a live daughter, and I want to keep her safe. I'm unwilling to subject you to a lifetime consumption of drugs and surgeries that harm your body, alter your voice, sterilize you and offer nothing more than the lie that you can or even should change your biological sex. In 1963, 30 seconds. a Democratic congressman read the 45 goals of communism into the congressional record. Number one, get control of the schools and the teachers associations. Number six, eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and violation of free speech. Your excuse is we don't want to go down a slippery slope. Unfortunately, you've already slipped down into the muck and the mire we offer you a hand back up on the embankment. We expect and will respect you if you honor the God-given rights established between the parents and their children. We respect vibrant education, but we that respect sexual and social indoctrination. Our, and that Welcome is time. Welcome to America. Our next speaker is Ann Pickens, Myra Engelbert, and then Carlos Taylor. Ann Pickens. Mara Engelbert. Thank you, school board. Over the past several meetings, I have noticed a pattern throughout the speeches given to the majority of students and parents in support of the LGBTQ reforms. There was no support at home during COVID, and if they had not found the support group on social media, they would have killed themselves. So quickly to resort to the ultimate long-term side effect with no thought or ramifications of taking a life. Since the topic of the speech is focused on long-term side effects, let's talk about the side effects not mentioned, like the effects of transitioning and the drugs used to do so. According to the St. Louis Children's Hospital, the possible long-term side effects of hormone blockers are delayed growth plate closure, low bone density where patients have to take extra supplements to keep their bodies and bones healthy and strong, and the extra side effects that are not yet known meaning that our children are becoming experiments. I've heard the argument that hormone blockers are temporary, which may or may not be true. However, the individuals have to continue to take blockers and hormones long-term to keep fighting what they are naturally born to be. The National Library of Medicine states that transgender women have a higher risk of VTE, which are blood clots that form throughout the body in the veins. They have a higher risk of stroke, meningenoma, heart attacks, and breast cancer. The risk of cardiovascular diseases are so high that doctors recommend continual monitoring. Patients are also advised to participate in screening programs based on the reproductive organs they were born with because identifying as a different gender does not change your natural biology. Throughout my research, I have noticed that medical centers and hospitals utilize terms as unwanted physical changes, deciding one's gender, gender expression, and undesired sex and gender. All of these terms imply it's not fact or truth, but one's opinions. All of us here tonight have a similar goal. Our goal is to protect the children. 
I will continue to stand here and stand for our children with the truth that God created two genders, XY chromosomes for males and XX chromosomes for females. These facts will not change no matter what hormones are taken and what surgeries are done. Protect the children and the students by telling them the truth, all of the truth, not just what social media wants them to hear. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carlos Taylor, Lindsay Sawyer, and then Jennifer Haggerty. Thank you. At the, the last time I was at this podium, I was told that some people walked out on my speech because they felt that I was rude. And all I was doing was telling the truth, which I'm going to do again tonight. Boys can't transform into girls, and girls can't transform into boys. That's impossible. Many have tried, all have failed, which means it has a 100% failure rate. When you call a boy she and a girl he, you are lying to them. Stop doing that. The sooner you stop lying to these kids, the sooner they can get the help that they need. Now here's a famous quote about truth. The truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. That's Winston Churchill from the UK. But I have a challenge for the school board tonight, for those that disagree with me. I want you to name me one individual that has successfully transformed themselves into the opposite sex. Not asking for five, not asking for 10 or 20, just one. Now, if you can't do that, what does that tell you? Our next speaker is Lindsay Sawyer, Jennifer Haggerty, and then Annie Palumbo. Good evening. I'm changing subjects a little bit here. Um, I have a child affected by the ODS admission situation, and I'm speaking for other families who are unable to be here and advocate for their children. So a lottery has barely ever been used in second grade admissions. The last one to two years, it may have been used for a very small handful of seats after all the top candidates were placed. It's never been used for all the seats, and it's never even been used for the majority of seats. We have a very large school division. Not a single memo or communication from the gifted office state this, stated this would be part of the process. Needless to say, the whole process. It is not in the plan. Our gifted resource teachers, they had no clue it was part of the process. The teachers had no idea. Dozens of emails, communications, texts all back up the fact that literally no one knew it could be part of the process to select seats. And obviously the parents had no idea. The lack of transparency didn't stop there. We started asking questions to clarify. Leadership would say they didn't get our email despite the address being typed correctly. Then they would not answer anything via email, only schedule calls, and the answers we received on the calls weren't answers. They were scripted statements repeated over and over to us, while at the same time saying it's going to be so much better next year when it would no longer matter for our children. Then a meeting was held, and we thought maybe they're going to finally answer questions, only to be told no questions here, no interruptions, no comments. So as a parent, this has been a really discouraging road. And I'm saddened, as like many of the GRTs and teachers who I've spoke to, that no effort was made to differentiate between 244 kids. It's disheartening because each application has hours and hours of work put into it. It also flies in the face of the goal of the selection committee, which is stated to choose the top 130, not to just make a group of the top 25%. This selection process has always protected the most vulnerable students who need services the most, 
And for the first time in second grade admissions, the children with the highest level of needs are just left unaccounted for. It's not okay that half of them, just based on random luck, are gonna receive a full-time advanced curriculum for the next seven years. 30 seconds. And the other half are just out of luck with maybe 20, 30 minutes of a GRT coming in their classroom. A full-time advanced curriculum at ODS is very different than the cluster because if it was the same, we wouldn't even need ODS. Highly gifted children are very vulnerable and many struggle. Please, please consider these kids that were left out and hold the leadership accountable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Haggerty, Annie Palumbo, and then Courtney Jacobs. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight and thank you for your commitment to ensuring that all of our students are given an equal opportunity to excel academically. I'm speaking tonight as a parent of a rising second grader in the Virginia Beach Public Schools. As you know, the selection process for the Old Donation School recently came under scrutiny when a handful of school officials failed to adhere to the approved policies leaving many qualified students without a seat in the program. The goal of the approved selection process is to assess each student's qualifications and capabilities and provide the top candidates with an opportunity to unlock their full potential. When school officials fail to follow the approved policies, many of these students are denied that chance. I'm here to make a plea to the school board for a speedy resolution to the snafu that left that likely left my son without a seat at the, OD, excuse me, the ODS gifted program for the next seven years. I urge you to use your positions as advocates for our students and their families, to hastily reissue seats, to ensure that the most qualified students have a home at ODS, and that the lottery system is only utilized after the top candidates have a seat, which is the approved process of, of selection and how this should have been executed. Alternatively, I ask that you ensure the top candidates who are not given a seat due to the misguided and unapproved changes are guaranteed a third grade spot in the 2024-2025 school year. I did not grow up in a participation trophy society. <laughs> if my children do not qualify for particular services or opportunities, I accept that. It's my job to teach them how to gracefully handle disappointment and failure. It is also my job to teach them the importance of fairness and equality, urge them to fight for justice and against injustice, and advocate for those who do not have the ability to advocate for themselves. If ODS was overwhelmed with the number of applicants this year, there should have been a school board approved solution, but instead the school board was bypassed, and ODS simply put all 244 higher ranking students into a lottery, leaving the parents of the top of top qualified students crossing their fingers that their children's number was drawn. 30 seconds. As a parent, I will do all I can to foster and further my children's innate strengths and skills, and I'll stand up for them when they are denied access to resources that per policy they should be receiving. As an educational community, community we, we must do all we can to ensure that no qualified student is denied a seat at ODS due to process errors, and we must remain dedicated to providing all students with a fair and honest chance to succeed and reach their full potential. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Annie Palumbo, Courtney Jacobs, and then Noah Moreland. Hello, Jessica Owens. I've watched you read a book or do whatever you're doing up there. You know, there's 40 speakers here tonight, and just because they're not talking about what you're interested in, you could at least have the respect and pay them some attention. Anyway, that's very rude of the speakers. My name is Annie Palumbo. I am an activist. I run the Unmask Our Kids page. I'm here to discuss the moral decay of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Our children are in peril with half of you up on that dais. What is wrong with you? I've never seen a group of certain adults on that dais fight harder than you have to keep pornography and all of the LGBTQT ideology in our schools. Who are you? What's your real agenda? The good thing is, is that a giant has awakened and parents and citizens are starting to rise up and fight against you like never before. 
you are the snake and the head is getting ready to be severed. As I watched bits and pieces of the last school board meeting, I couldn't help but notice the lack of morals and schoolgirl mentality that the majority of you have up there. There was even a hot mic moment where the chairwoman, Trinace Riggs, called a decorated Navy veteran, Jerome Bell, an ASS hole. You know the word I'm talking about. I should say it. I really want to say it, but you'll probably remove me for another year. For those of you in this room that don't know, I was removed for a year for holding up the pornography that's in our libraries. So here I stand, a parent who has become an activist for 64,000 kids I've never met. I do it because I know that we're in a, a spiritual battle of good versus evil. I'm joined by parents, grandparents, and citizens who feel the same way I do. And somehow we come to these meetings trying to defend, to defend ourselves to you. We try to prove to you that we're not book burners, we're not bigots, we're not racists, we're not homophobes or domestic terrorists. I, Annie Palumbo, am going, putting you on notice tonight. We are done playing the game of defense, and we are now going on offense. You see, all we want is for the hardcore pornography that's in our schools removed, as well as the indoctrination of our children. We will not try to prove anymore that we are not book burners, bigots, racists, or domestic terrorists. We will turn it on you, the manipulators that you are, and we are going to start asking you to prove to the public why you aren't sexual predators who are distributing pornography to minors. Aren't all of the adults on the, why aren't all of the adults on the diet saying, seconds. Books, books are pornography, they should be removed. You know this is wrong, yet you are cowards. You're too afraid of what the in crowd will think about. So you make destructive decisions for our children just to stay popular with those who think like you do. Most of you have no business being within five feet of a child, much less in a position of making decisions for what is good for these kids. I will leave you with this. Ephesians 5.11 and my why have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness and that is time expose them. Our next speaker is Courtney Jacobs, Noah Moreland, and then Donna Frulan. Good evening. As a parent of a rising second grader, I stand before you to address a matter of utmost importance, the fairness, the lack of transparency, and the integrity of the selection process at Old Donation School. Before delving into the intricacies of the process, <clears throat> I'd like to share a personal anecdote. Just this past weekend, I purchased two summer bridge books beyond my son's actual grade level for him to complete over the summer. To motivate him, I promised him a reward of ice cream upon completion. He finished both books in a mere two days and confidently remarked, that will be two ice cream cones. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is the caliber of the child who, despite exceptional test scores in the 99th percentile, top scores in his elementary school class, outstanding grades, and PAL scores that demonstrate reading abilities at an eighth grade level, did not get into ODS this year. He was placed on the wait list. Disappointment and confusion resonated not only within me, but within his teacher. He, she, one of his teachers stated, I am shocked he did not get in. I have no idea how the process works, but I have no idea how they picked those kids. Today, I implore the school board to thoroughly examine the process of applying to ODS and establish a selection process that is transparent, fair, and maintains integrity. This year, the use of a lottery system by Dr. Kelly and Dr. Rogers to determine the top applicants has raised significant concern. Nowhere in the 188-page gifted plan does it specify the use of a lottery. It states on page 8 and page 52, consider the feasibility of using a lottery, but nowhere does it specify how that is selection, how selection is to be done. Moreover, parents were colored, encouraged to appeal the decision, but if the process was truly based on a lottery, why were appeals even offered? Why is this so secretive? Additionally, rumors surrounding the lottery process have only fueled confusion. In my district, it appeared that sibling preference played a significant role in the selection of the ODS lottery winners. Furthermore, if, the decided, if one decided to appeal the decision, their children were removed from the wait list. I would not be able to tell you if these are rumors or not because there is no transparency in this process at all. Having clear guidelines with actual steps for ODS and the application committee to follow would give parents some peace of mind into the integrity and transparency of the entire process. The 188 pages in the Plans for Educating the Gifted needs revamping. It states an annual review will be conducted each application cycle. Has it been done yet this year? What demographics are removed from the applications? There are too many vague concepts and no specific strategy laid out if the top amount of applicants exceeds the amount. seconds. Having clear-cut plans, laid out procedures, and transparency will ensure a selection process that does not happen again like it did this year. 
It is the responsibility of the Virginia Beach School Board to hold ODS accountable when deviations from approved procedures occur. Therefore, I kindly request that the school board conducts a thorough investigation into this matter and takes the appropriate action for this past application cycle to ensure that every eligible student be granted an equal opportunity to be considered for admission. Thank you. Our next speaker is Noah Moreland, then Donna Fruhalen, and then A.J. Paul. The National Assessment of Educational Progress recently released data concerning our nation's studies, and according to national exams administered last fall, our country's 13-year-olds scored an average of 256 out of 500 in reading and 271 out of 500 in math. Compared to just a few years ago, this is a drop of close to 10 points and hasn't been this low since 1971. By shutting down schools during COVID, this wiped out nearly two decades of progress in school improvement. And perhaps the saddest metric I learned is that 31% of students say they never or hardly ever read books, which is an increase of 20% in the same amount of time. So what has our school system replaced the fundamentals with? The answer is the cult of activism and gender ideology. The National Education Association, one of the largest teacher organizations in the U.S., if you visit their website, talks not about raising test scores in the education of our youth, but rather about protect protecting transgender youth and the role of gender ideology in public schools under the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are teachers and staff hired to teach under 18 children in what should be academics, but instead play to indoctrinate America's students into a completely secular and sexualized worldview and a misguided, dangerous, and depraved effort to keep them safe. It's why the test scores are in free fall. It's why the students are depressed. It's why they hate to read. It's why they feel like life is meaningless. I was disappointed by the result of the last school board meeting, but it only strengthens my resolve to continue speaking, and I will continue speaking until something changes. And indeed, things are changing. A vote that a few years ago would have been eight to three was six to five, and need I remind you that election year is right around the corner. You work for parents, and until recently, you were allowed to get away with whatever you wanted with zero consequences. The consequences have come, and they will continue to come, and because of your actions, the children in the school system will suffer as a result. Your goal should be to help integrate parents in one of the most important aspects of their child's young lives, but instead you shut them out and hide things from them. A person who truly has the best intentions does not hide behind vulnerable and confused youth of our schools. Now, test scores are important, but it's not really about that. We are fighting for the very souls of these children. We are aboard a ship set on a crash course to unspeakable disaster, and if we don't plot another path, we will lose an entire generation to a mob that demands children be sexualized and used seconds. for the benefit of our godless society. But it doesn't have to be this way. Virginia Beach used to be ahead of the curve, and it can be again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donna Frulahan, A.J. Paul, and then William Devins. Good evening. The name is Donna Fullahan, just for your knowledge. The first school board meeting I attended was two weeks ago. I'm a 76-year-old grandmother, and regarding those students who were present two weeks ago that think my generation is no longer relevant to them or their generation, I'm not surprised. As a teenager, I thought the same thing. But then I grew up. I thought, I thought it was interesting that there was one student that was screaming at all of you to grow up as if she had. Can I give you an example of a, a student who was well on her way to growing up? She's an 11-year-old girl who is a recent immigrant to our country. At the school she attends, some girls began teasing her, making fun of her, and telling her she would never have any friends. How did she respond? Did she strike out at them and hit them? Did she have a meltdown and go home and crying to her mother? Did she ask for protected status? No. She just politely responded to them by saying, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to learn. She showed respect for herself and respect for the girls making fun of her. Wow, what a concept. I remember the bullying in my schools. It was a sport back then, too. Human nature will always be sinful, no matter what generation we live in. As one lady two weeks ago stated, 
It's a matter of the heart. Only God can change that heart. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, In Christ we are a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, new things emerge. I'm disappointed that the school board members would vote to cater to a group of students and parents who have been groomed by a special interest group. It appears these students are props being used by this group to promote an agenda in the schools. In reality, they are vulnerable children who can be permanently harmed, as you've heard tonight. So-called experts today give parents a choice of life or death for their children experiencing gender confusion. That becomes bribery for a new profitable medical industry being fostered in our country. There are other choices and there are other experts. I recently spoke with a retired teacher who told me a male student who liked to wear, told me of a male student who liked to wear his sister's underwear to school. As it turned out, it was a tactile issue with him and nothing more. Today, he's married to second. a woman and they have three beautiful children. What if the policies you are promoting today would have been in effect a few years ago? Would we have more, another case of the ones we've heard about tonight? Please enact Governor Youngkin's education policies that respect and protect all children. Stop promoting an ideology that can cause great harm and irreparable damage to a child. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aju Paul. William Devins, and then Nicola Jorvez. Thank you for the opportunity to express my thoughts and suggestions around the ODS selection process. I would like to approach it from three angles. Policy, process, justice. Let's talk about policy. In the plan on page 87 and 88, the ODS school has been defined as a centralized full-time gifted school. Further, it says, the curriculum expands and extends specifically to meet the needs of gifted students. The content of the course is both compacted and extended to students, but also covering materials in more depth. On the contrary, the gifted cluster model says, identify gifted students since grades two to five are clustered in heterogeneous classrooms, typically in groups of six to eight, and are taught by a cluster teacher trained in gifted education at the neighborhood school. This clearly shows a difference between a dedicated program at ODS and a cluster program in a zone school. Further on policy, what is the approved selection process? As per local plan and memo issued on August 11th of 2020 and August 17th of 2022, the district followed all norms in terms of administration of the tests, auto applications with no parent input. What was not followed is the mechanism used to choose the 130 from the identified group of 244 students. Though the district defends the approach, empl defends the approach employed as a practice in place for 15 years. I call on attention the meeting that occurred on Jan 8, 2022, where this very topic was asked to the school district by the school board. And I quote, the answer was, we do not currently have a lottery system in place in the Virginia Beach School District. I think it's obvious that the statement of the 15 years of practice is factually incorrect. Let's talk about process now. The approved plan has a five-year term. It is therefore understandable that it cannot address in detail each circumstance that may arise in that time frame. Therefore, the mitigating process is to ensure that the plan is a way to review it. This was 30 necessary. seconds. Hence, I want to bring the topic of justice. It is evident that the justice was not done in this last step. If indeed there was a challenge posed by having more eligible applicants to ODS, the process of identification should have been passed, a process presented, and approved before implementation. Hence, I call on this school board and the leadership to sincerely investigate this matter and work towards resolution steps before and that is time. the start of the 2023 Academy. Our next Thank speaker you. is William Devins, Nicola Jervev, and then Daphne Stagg.
Good evening, school board members, meeting attendees, and those watching these proceedings. On June 12th, 2023, six of you voted to approve the Owens LGBTQ plus resolution, which by its unrestricted protection clauses assails parental rights. By passing the Owens LGBTQ resolution with unrestricted protection clauses, you six members confirmed your commitment that Virginia Beach school premises serve as sanctuary areas for LGBTQ students. By approving this resolution, you support Virginia Beach schools being black holes from which parents are denied critical information about what LGBTQ activities their children are pursuing while on school premises. Whether it is adopting a pronoun, adopting a new name, or engaging in LGBTQ plus discussions or options with counselors or teachers, it can only be presumed that by approving this resolution, you believe LGBTQ students must be shielded from parental interference. And what about school staff? Can you imagine the intimidation to any poor teacher or staff member should they discuss informing a parent of a student's LGBTQ proclivities? This resolution only makes them more mindful of the pressure to keep private what happens on school property. Like Las Vegas, what happens on the school premises must stay on the school premises. You six members who approve this resolution must believe that the privacy right of a student younger than the age of consent outweighs a parent's right to know what is happening to their child. This philosophy is flat out irresponsible. For this reason, I urge all who are listening to vote these six members out of office at the earliest possible opportunity. Remember their names, Jessica Owens, Trenas Riggs, Beverly Anderson, Jennifer Franklin, Stacy Martin, Kimberly Melnick. As for those members who voted to disapprove of this resolution, my hat goes off to you. I pass on my greatest appreciation and thank you for your vote. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Our next speaker is Nicola Gervais, Daphne Stagg, and then Kristen Arnold. Good evening, board members. My name is Nick Georgiev, the father of Galia, a rising second grade student. My daughter was selected to have access to full-time advanced education in ODS for grades two to eight. She is a top candidate with the highest rating possible. However, some administrators illegally decided to conduct a lottery that is not approved and was not communicated with parents. I, as a parent, didn't sign up for this process. I could have made different decisions if I was informed that a lottery might be the tool that will determine all these seats for ODS. They didn't follow the plan to identify the top 130 students that need services. The committee gave up on doing their job. For the first year, candidates from the higher tier are left behind and deemed. The ODS acceptance letter stated that all kids were chosen after, quote, careful consideration. The lottery is illegal and caused serious equity issues. It is inequitable to deny these students same services. These highly gifted students have learning and social emotional need that cannot be met at the gifted cluster model. BBCPS has ethical, moral, and legal obligations to the students that are rated the same but didn't get lucky. There's no question that the actions of the division in this year's grade two through eight selection process for the ODS program placement has failed to conform to state law and regulation, as well as local plan and allocation of public funds for those purposes. We are all against single criteria process Lottery is exactly that process, single criteria, which is against VA state law. We do not want to choose our teachers, students, or the superintendent with a lottery. Random is not equity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daphne Stagg, then Kristen Arnold, then Andrew Beckett. 
Good evening. Um, I was wondering if I could ask Trinise to wake up and listen to the speakers. Um, and I just want to talk about history tonight. So um, this reminds me so much of the 1990s prescription drug epidemic. Remember when the drug companies came in and educated all of the teachers about ADHD and ADD, and next thing you know, half of the students were on medication? Uh, this, this is exactly what's going on. There's an agenda, there's an industry that's making billions of dollars, and you're the fools that are gonna ruin people's lives, just like in the 1990s, when the drug companies put all these kids on drugs because they taught the teachers how to uh, pick out the kids with ADHD. Remember that? I'm sure Trinise, Miss Weems, remember that? And uh, where's Beverly? I'm sure she remembers. So there were kids, they, they, you actually ruined people's lives, families. I know one boy, who was put on uh, medication because he was having a hard time at school because he, his parents got a divorce. They moved from their big, beautiful house on the, on the golf course to a little tiny apartment in town, and his school was changed, and he was having a really hard time, so they put him on medication. And seven years later, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar due to extended use of his ADHD medicine. And there's another little boy from Virginia Beach who was a friend of my son's. He came from a little French, uh, he was from a French town in Africa. And when he got here, he couldn't speak English. And so they thought, oh, well, we'll put you on medication and just to get you through a hard time. Well, he was so addicted to that medication by the time he was 15, he dropped out of school, ended up on drugs and in jail, and his parents moved back to France with his little sister. They were a wonderful family. And 30 seconds. He was a beautiful little boy. And well, uh, what would you do if 10-year-old came to school and said, um, I'm a boy, a little girl that wears dresses, comes to school and says, I'm a boy. What are you going to do? Are you going to uh, bring them to the consultants and your special secret little uh, yeah, social workers and ruin their lives just like in time. the 1990s? Our next They're speaker, a bunch of fools. and that is time. Our next speaker is Kristen Arnold, Andrew Bennett, and then James Davids. Good evening. Like many school boards around our nation, the school board of Virginia Beach is at a crossroads. I agree and stand with Ms. Chloe Cole and the many parents and citizens represented here. And for the purposes of these three minutes, my greatest concern is the role and responsibility of the Virginia Beach School Board. The school board of the city of Virginia Beach, representing the people of the community, is the legislative body for the school division. And the resolution that was passed on June 12th does very little to address the people the school board is representing, or at least the people that they are beholden to, the parents and the taxpayers. I'd like to thank five people that have a conviction about who they represent since they did not vote for the recently passed resolution. Thank you, Carolyn Weems, Kathleen Brown, Michael Callan, David Culpepper, and Victoria Manning for your integrity to acknowledge something that many school boards around the country have forgotten, that parents are the first educators. And any policy or resolution that hinders the relationship and knowledge of parents between their children is at best poor policy. According to the resolution, the school board affirms, supports, and values each of our students and staff and will continue to further to create a welcoming, safe, and inclusive learning environment. Where are the rights of the parents? Are they not the authority on what is safe for their student? 
elected school boards are the first and foremost accountable to parents and taxpayers. It is our duty as adults to protect our children and each child's parent is their first protector. If this resolution continues in its current form and direction, parents will not be able to guard their children as they see is best for them. The school board has no business coming between this time-honored relationship and bond. History is rife with governing bodies that have done as much, and the result is never good for anyone. This sort of policy isn't just about the support that the school board is giving to the LGBTQ plus community. It is about whether you respect the jurisdiction you have as representatives of parents and taxpayers. I hope that this school board will realize that before any harm is done to students and parents. Please consider what is at stake in the precedent you set here. We need a balanced approach to this issue that represents all families in this district. Governor Youngkin's model policies do just that. And that is time. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Andrew Bennett, James Davids, and then Douglas Keeper. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I'm here to express my concerns with the ODS selection process that was instituted for the selection of the second grade class for the upcoming school year. The selection process utilized has resulted in an inequitable and unacceptable situation for many of the most vulnerable students in our school system. As you have heard, 244 students were identified as, quote, top students, receiving a rating of a four by the ODS selection committee. After a random draw, only 130 students were offered placement at ODS to receive access to a full-time advanced curriculum for grades two through eight. The other students who were not as lucky in this coin flip decision are to be placed in a gifted cluster classroom at their home school. ODS was created to serve a need. It is not some sort of bonus or perk or prestigious academy. This claim is not just my opinion, but has been published by the school system. Page 80 of the gifted five-year plan lists three questions that the selection committee uses when examining ODS applications. The first question reads, quote, is there evidence throughout the application that this student needs more than what is provided through the resource cluster program at his slash her school, end quote. Further, informational material shared by the v BBCPS Office of Gifted Programs ahead of the 2023 gifted identification process states, the purpose of ODS is to meet the needs of those gifted learners whose needs far exceed what is offered through the VBCPS general curriculum and gifted cluster model. How is it then that 130 students would receive a full-time gifted curriculum at ODS, while 114 students are to be placed into a cluster class when the selection committee identified all of these students as having needs that exceed what is offered through the cluster model. That's 40% of this population that would knowingly be serviced below their needs for the next seven years. Well, I commend efforts to cast a wider net and ensure a more effective gift identification process overall. This cannot be done at the expense of students who require a full-time advanced academic setting. Denying such services from those who need it the most will not only hinder growth and development of some of the brightest minds in our district, but will also negatively impact the mental health of many students who won't receive seconds. access to the proper academic and social emotional support. I can't imagine the district, that this district would find it equitable to utilize a random selection process to determine what services are provided or not provided to other groups of exceptional learners. In closing, I ask that you work with your colleagues in VBCPS leadership to implement an appropriate and equitable solution to this dilemma ahead of the start of the 2023 school year. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Davids, Douglas Keeper, and then Philip Egan. Good evening, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak also. Um, there's been a lot of powerful comments made uh, tonight, and I will not 
uh, repeat in any way some of theirs, uh, because at least at this point in time, I have not heard of one lawyer representing you. And it's probably the least thing that you want is a lawyer to, to do it, but I, not only have I been a lawyer for uh, more than 45 years, but in addition to that, I also served as a public school board member. And so therefore, I know what it is to sit in your seat. And if this issue was presented to me, one thing I would certainly raise is, well, can this affect me, possibly, this volunteer service that I have, can this be a detriment to me in my financial future? And that's what I would be concerned about. Let me just address a few, uh, few things about that. And, and from my perspective, uh, a little bit more background, I have defended governments. I have um, uh, served as a medical malpractice defense lawyer as well as a medical malpractice plaintiff's lawyer. So I, I know a little bit about personal injury actions and what happens when people suffer those personal injuries. And generally speaking, what I would be concerned if I were you is the fact that there's something called punitive damages, which are beyond insurance coverage. The reason why I raise that is because there is something that's the Achilles heels for the LGBT groups that are forcing their will upon the school boards and trying to cut out parents from this whole equation. The common law said that children are too young. They lack experience, they lack judgments, that's why Parents were the ones to do that. And up, up until the present day, you have to have a, be a majority, you have to be at least 18 years old, some states 21, to be able to enter a contract, to buy a car. So a person, a youngster, can't buy a car, but yet they are going with the aid of a school board, or strike that, a, a school administrator, they're going to make radical changes, not only to their body, but also their future. 80% of which are re going to regret that sometime in the future. You know this is going to come up and will be a, a area for... for uh, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, some, some enterprising uh, plaintiff's lawyers. Trust me, it will happen. This, uh, this time, the, in, in our present circumstances, we have something unique going on. Something akin to the Tuskegee Airmen who were experimented on, something similar to the Japanese Americans who went into intern camps, something similar to the church and the priests preying upon kids. This is crazy. This is unnatural. This is against. And that is time. That's why you're. Our voting. next speaker is Douglas Keeper, then Philip Egan. Douglas Keeper. Okay. Is Philip Egan. I'm Philip Egan. I've got three girls that graduated from Virginia Beach Public Schools, but I, I feel compelled to speak as many others have expressed tonight. I've attended several school board meetings in the past, but the May meeting uh, was the most disappointing by far. Uh, the tenor of the meeting took a downward turn after recognition of people's accomplishments, which I feel like is, is so good, but it's so sad to see us uh, go down this road. Uh, one school board member who proposed a resolution claimed discrimination during discussion of a simple thing like ordering of the topics. Uh, discussion was consumed by different opinions on sexuality, trans athletics, keeping secrets from parents about sexuality, and on and on. Not a single minute was devoted to improving test results or quality of instruction, which in my opinion is the school's chief mission and prime directive. I believe the school board in Virginia Beach is losing its way. Scheduling the vote on Mrs. Owens' resolution for Pride Month shows an obsession with cultural and moral issues. There was an admission that the impetus for the resolution was derived from student wishes, and allowing 27 students to go first appeared to be a deliberate attempt to limit parental feedback. 
Many students accused parents of being haters and roundly rejected Governor Youngkin's guidelines. Mrs. Owens agreed that present guidelines and state law already prohibit discrimination. And the resolution added nothing new. Then Mrs. Owens added her resolution was not related to the new draft guidelines and obvious mistruth, considering students' previous comments. I review hundreds of resumes every year for a high-tech jobs right here in Tidewater, and I can tell you that you're not equipping students to be successful in the job market. You're teaching them to lie. I noticed the revised resolution excludes athletics. So one can conclude that discrimination is allowed in athletics, but nowhere else. We're turning logic on its head. I don't agree with allowing pronouns which conflicts with good grammar. An individual cannot be them. This is co-opting language, which has long established rules and should form a common bond, not become a minefield for insulting each other. Schools must teach good grammar and not teach children to lie. That'll make them successful in their life after school. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adam Sawyer. Hi there. Uh, I'm going to be speaking, speaking about the gifted services and selection process into ODS this year. A lot of people have already touched on the important issues. Um, I'm really here just to advocate for the kids who are getting denied services that they deserve. They're six and seven years old. They don't have the ability to advocate for themselves. Clearly, the people in charge of this process do not find it in their best interest to advocate for these children, so that's why I'm here speaking tonight. Um, this is the first year in the history of ODS that some of the top kids in this district are being denied the services that they deserve. We cannot get straight answers for why this happened this year. Um, there's already a process in place for selection into ODS. The process is outlined in the five-year plan. It's in all the communications on the gifted services website, all the communications to the parents, the gifted resource teachers. This process was actually approved by this school board. Um, however, it was not followed this year. Um, and this resulted in the first year where the top candidates aren't gonna be going there this fall. Two main reasons. There's more, but these are the two main ones. The use of the lottery, which many people have touched on. Dr. Rogers, Dr. Kelly like to say that this has been used for 15 years. Someone earlier spoke earlier about how in this very setting at a school board meeting, it was stated by the head of gifted services at that time that a lottery system is not used in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. It's also not anywhere documented in this plan or process that was approved by this school board. So I don't know where they get that from. Um, the other main reason is the changing of the ranking system. This is getting down into the details, but um, as someone was speaking earlier about how scores in Virginia Beach City Public Schools continue to decline, it's interesting that the number of gifted kids identified this year doubled, and that's because of the ranking system. In previous years, three individuals on the committee would review the same application. They would each give their score, so a student would either be a 444, a 443, a 433, a 333, et cetera. This year, those three members all had to come to a consensus and give one score. So if the loud voice was someone that had a four and there were two other members that thought they were a three, they might have been made a four. Clearly, 30 those seconds. two individuals are not equal. Um, lastly, um, I'm asking this school board to hold the individuals accountable for the process that happened this year to come to a solution before the fall. It's not okay to say, oh, we'll fix it next year. We messed up. Thank you. Okay, it is now time to move on to our next agenda item, which is information. 12A, Interim Financial Statements, May 2023. 
Welcome Daniel Hopkins, our Director of Business Services. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chairwoman Weems, School Board members, Dr. Spence. As of May, the overall revenue trend remains acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. The Virginia Department of Education released the final fiscal year 2023 payment calculation template on June 8th. Our revised projection state revenue is a deficit of approximately $1 million. What was approved didn't change much from what was reported back in April. Key changes from our original budget is an increase in sales tax of $11 million with an offsetting decrease to basic aid of $10 million. Federal revenues are showing a favorable trend. We have received impact aid payments of approximately $15 million through the end of May. Other sources of revenue through the month of May are favorable at this point in the fiscal year. This is mainly due to the Stop Arm Enforcement Program and sale of capital assets. This next graph shows that the sales tax receipts are at an acceptable level. Year to date through May, we are approximately $2 million higher than the same time last year. June sales tax is down from the previous year by $960,000. The last graph shows that the expenditures and encumbrances continue to be acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. At this point, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now we're at um, B, Policy Review Committee, the PRC recommendations. Welcome, uh, Kamala Linetti, our school board attorney. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cammie Linetti, and on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I will be presenting for information 13 policies that the Policy Review Committee looked at last month. First policy we have up is um, section two, which is our administration section. This has to do with principles. The only recommendations are removal of the editor's notes and updating the legal references to this particular policy. There are no other recommendations for this policy. Are there any questions on this policy? Hearing no questions on this policy, we'll look at policy 241. This is administrative principles, also under our administrative section of the policies. After review on this, there are no recommended changes coming out of the policy review committee. Are there any questions on this policy? Hearing no questions on policy 241, I'll move on to 244, which is department grade level chairs. Uh, this policy also falls under the administrative section. Again, after review, the school board, the policy review committee is not recommending any changes for the school board. Are there any questions on policy 244? Hearing no questions on policy 244, we will move on to policy 248, which is salaries and compensation. Again, also under the administrative section. The only recommendation for amendments to this policy is to remove the editor's notes from the end of the policy. Any questions on 248? Hearing no questions on 248, we'll move on to 249, which is recruitment and selection, again, under the administrative section. After review, the policy recommendation, policy review committee is not recommending any amendments or changes to policy 249. Any questions on 249? Hearing no questions on 249, we'll move to 252, again, also in the administrative section. This is probationary terms and reassignment of principals, assistant principals, and supervisors, a relatively short policy. The only recommendation we are making at this time is to remove the editor's notes from the middle of the policy and an update on the punctuation, the legal reference. Are there any questions about 252? Hearing no questions on 252, we'll move on to 253, also in the administrative section, which is evaluation of administrative staff. The only uh, changes there are, are updating on the legal references and updating the, the amendment section. Are there only any questions about policy 253? Hearing no questions on 253, we'll move on to 254, which is administrative compensation. After review, the Policy Review Committee is not recommending any changes to Policy 254. Any questions on 254? Hearing no questions on 254, we'll move on to Policy 258, which is professional development. The recommendation for the Policy Review Committee is to remove the editor's notes at the end of the policy. And there are no other, uh, further recommendations. Are there any questions on 258? Hearing no questions on 258, we will move on to 397. 397 is a proposal for a new policy. 
policy 397 would, the title recommended under the business and instructional operations section would be Knox Lane administration in response to a suspected opioid overdose in a school setting. This is a pretty long policy if you take a look at it and I think Mrs. Um, Manning may be able to be, provide you some input because she worked with the school Advise, school Health Advisory Board, and the recommendation is too that we implement a policy that will allow for what we refer to as Narcan in our schools under certain conditions. And this is to be available in our schools so that we can treat potential overdoses for persons in our schools who are exhibiting signs of opioid overdoses. It's a fairly extensive policy that comes explaining when we will get it. Part of this comes out of the General Assembly authorizing schools to now be able to have prescriptions for Narcan. This has been available to us for a few years, but we've now had the opportunity to go ahead and make some determinations about how we will implement it. The SHAB went ahead and looked at this policy, recommended we come forward with this. We brought this over to Policy Review Committee, which took a fairly extensive look at the different conditions on this. Again, this is a, an entirely new policy that would come forward, and there are a lot of conditions to it. I won't go in depth unless you have questions. I don't know if Mrs. Manning wants to make any um, comments on the recommendation coming out of the SHAB. Yeah, so um, I want to thank Ms. Sawala for all of her input in dra drafting this policy along with Ms. Linetti. Um, one thing that we did discuss in policy review is that this is not required by law currently, but there are some discussions amongst legislators that this may be presented as a bill um, in, in the legislator, leg legislature, but we're just kind of um, taking it on ourselves, thinking that this is something that we should provide. Um, currently, we're not in this policy not going to be uh, providing it at elementary schools. We felt that that was too much to undertake right now um, because there is some professional development that's going to be required for staff members in order to implement this policy. So um, I, I think that anything that's not included in this policy here will be included in the school health uh, the um, school health manual. I believe it's is what yes. It, typically, our more detailed regulations and procedures, particularly in health things, appear in manuals. On that, didn't seem appropriate for the policy because those things can change. They will have to be extensive training. Ms. Sawala has looked at that, and I think Judge Shab's looked at that. So the more details on when you administered, how much you administered, those type of things are going to appear in the manuals that our medical professionals will use. Correct. Thank you. Are there any questions on this policy? All right. Hearing no questions on this policy, we will move on to our next policy, which is 4-1. Four is our personnel section. As you've noticed the last couple months, we've been going through section four, updating a lot of the policies and regulations. This is another one we're looking at. Under this particular policy, there were some extensive res um, amendments done to clarify our definitions of what a full-time employee is, explaining when they get budgeted positions, what type of benefits they're entitled to. You also see a section on part-time employees. Some of these are changes in the law that have come out of uh, both federal law that's coming out our own interpretations and it was a little confusing for us. So we needed to go through the full-time employees, the part-time employees, and what you also see is the temporary employees, which appears under section F defining when we have a temporary employee. There are some special exceptions that have been put into law in the last couple years that allow us to bring back certain types of teachers. Those are footnoted for you on there. Otherwise, the changes in this particular policy are done both to update the VDOE changes and how we define um, benefits, which you'll see in the next section coming in. But we needed to more carefully explain to our employees what was full-time, part-time, and uh, temporary employees. It seems unusual to people for, that we might have to do this. We have unique situations with some of our employees who work fewer hours or different hours than you might expect that we are, do classify as full-time or part-time. So this, is to, this policy is updated to make sure that's clarified. Are there any questions about this policy? All right, moving on to policy 437. This is employee benefits, retirement plans, and insurance. Again, these changes in here are, in this particular policy, are made to make it clear what a full-time employee is entitled to, what a part-time employee, so under section A1 is full-time, A2 is um, our part-time employees, and going on, there's some extensive revisions going through. Some of this also comes out of the Employee Mandate for Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, which defines certain types of um, 
certain amounts of work that an employee does that entitles them to be able to get benefits. So we've got an explanation. We've also gone through and explained the temporary employees and what benefits that they are entitled to. Just need a lot of updating to catch up with where the current law is and better explanation for our employees. Again, a relatively long policy. If you have specific questions about it, I think the human resources folks would be better qualified to do that. But we've updated the various plans, consolidated them into one policy, make sure it's clear for everybody. Are there any questions in particular about this policy? Hearing no questions about this policy, we'll move on to our last policy. This is policy 664, which are acceptable use policy. This might be our out of sequence from what we normally do. We had to do an update to a regulation involving federal law that required us to um, refer to certain types of conditions that we have to do in, in, when we're accessing internet for our students and what we can and can't do. This policy needed to be updated to reflect the change that we had in that regulation. So at the bottom of the first paragraph, you'll see a sentence that we've added that school division computer systems will not be used to violate school board policy or regulation or procedures. There's some uh, minor scrivener changes throughout. But that particular policy is being put in place to match a regulation that had to be changed to, to ma meet mandates under federal law. Again, a longstanding policy we've had about acceptable use for our computer systems, just updating some references that needed to be taken care of. Are there any questions on policy 664? At this time, I believe I have completed all the policies that need to be presented. I'm correct. Did, did Sorry, you have I a go? question? I do. Mr. Culpepper? Okay. Can if I go back briefly to uh, 437? Is there a, a budget impact associated with that policy change? I am. Um, let, me, let me bring up Ms. Woodhouse for uh, Good evening. Actually, there is not a budgetary impact. If anything, um, there could be future savings to the division um, because you would not be vested in VRS retirement benefits for employees that are less than a 1.0 full-time position. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to C the ad hoc committee to study open space uses for school property on Jericho Road. And I'm going to have Mrs. Weems, our vice chair, um, speak to this. Um, yes, colleagues, this is about the um, ad hoc committee you know, to study the open space on Jericho Road. We discussed this a couple weeks ago, um, and there was no, um, everybody was in agreement, and so everybody's kind of known about it for these last two weeks. It was in our agenda packet, and the public also knows about it. But basically, um, I would be the chair, and Ms. Martin, since she represents part of that area, would serve on the committee. We would make recommend recommendations to the school board um, about the uses of that open space when it comes available. Um, the ad hoc committee will not exceed nine members. Um, two city council members will be invited. The city manager and the um, superintendent will also invite, um, be invited to suggest one or more staff members to serve on the ad hoc committee. And we'll also have some community members. Um, everything's in your packet. It's self-explanatory. Chair Riggs, do you, I need to read all this or just ask for questions or what would you prefer? Uh, you mean read the, gov the cover sheet or the yeah. motion? I unless somebody has questions. Maybe that would answer it if they have questions. Does anybody have any questions? Ms. Manning. I just have a process question. I'm trying to pull up the bylaw to find out if this is an ad hoc committee. A chair, the chair has the authority to appoint an ad hoc committee, correct? Ms. Linetti, is this something correct. that we have, we don't have to vote on this, correct? What, you do have to vote the creation of the ad hoc committee. She gives you a recommendation for it at this point. And we've talked before about making sure that we're clear on the duties of ad hoc committees. So that's why we split it out here to make sure that you were all agreeable that these are the duties that you want for this ad hoc committee. So, Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and you discussed our duties, so... Ms. Melnick. I just wanted to thank the two of you, Ms. Martin and Ms. Weems, for stepping up to do this. Um, what the community may not know is that our committee work is extensive. Um, we, will, we will 
be touching on all of that tonight. It's pages long. Um, being a school board member is not attending a meeting every um, every other Tuesday. Um, we have many, many, many committees, and it is a huge commitment. And so just a, um, a thank you to the two who are willing to um, step up to do more committee work, albeit short, um, but, but I thank you for doing that and engaging the community in this conversation, um, continuing to strengthen a partnership with city council, which I think is really important, and, um, and doing this work um, to report back to us. Thank you. Can I add something, Chair? Yes, go ahead. And Ms. I would Harris. just like to add, because we did, I think, discuss in a workshop, so for the public that may not be aware, just briefly, um, our sixth grade, Bayside sixth grade campus is in a building now on Jericho Road that will be um, vacated in a few years. And so the um, object of this is to, this committee is to, to see what needs to be done or what we want to see that land become after the building is longer, no longer there. And I know um, Vice Mayor Lewis Jones and, and Rosemary Wilson and I have been working on this since before COVID. And we've um, met, and we met with Parks and Rec, and this is an underserved neighborhood community, the Aragona community, as far as outdoor space and parks and playgrounds and stuff. So this committee is just going to look at that land and make a recommendation. So just to kind of let the public know who may not be aware of what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. So um, I move that the school board um, move information item 12C to the action agenda for tonight's meeting. Do I have a second? Okay. Seconded by Mrs. Melnick. Um, is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Williams. Um, yes, and, and I do support this. You know, usually we go on information and then wait two weeks and go for action. But since we discussed it two weeks ago, um, in pretty much detail, and since we were all agreeable, um, the public has been made known because it was in our agenda packet, and it is an ad hoc committee, so that's why I'm going to support this one to be moved to action tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? Okay, seeing no more um, questions or, or um, discussions, all that are in favor of moving this uh, action, this information item 12C to action agenda for tonight's meeting, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you, Ms. Tony Otto. Um, D, information D, bylaw 128. Bylaw 128 is basically about committees, organizations, and boards for tonight's agenda. Um, after the vice chair and I discussed the recommendations for uh, committee assignments for this new um, uh, term of committee assignments, which this ends the end of this month, and so we start a new term. We discussed um, basically all of the committees, and there's several, as Mrs. Uh, Melnick mentioned a minute ago. Um, there's quite a bit of um, committees. And most of them are staying the same. Um, there's only one particular um, committee that there seems to be uh, some concern over, and that's the PRC membership. So there are two different feelings about that uh, committee. And so this is the most requested. And increasing the membership will allow our school board members to be involved in policy and bylaw drafting before matters come to the school board for consideration. This increases the number, and it does not change the four-year requirements for Bylaw 128. Um, and why we talked about this is because there's just there's there's five people that have um, interest in being on this. I feel like this would help um, in, in talking with Mrs. Weems. This will help with maybe the questions that are asked about around PRC and about uh, the, the different policies that are discussed. More people that are on that committee, I think of all the committees that probably would warrant to have more, stu more um, members of the school board on it. Uh, I think it will help answer questions. There'll be more discussion 
in that meeting and um, will help our board to understand our policies better. So I came up with the idea of possibly maybe we could do this and this would satisfy the people that wanted to be on this committee, all five. So that is why um, we're bringing it forth. Um, the other committee that we're talking about as well, um, the re to remove the mayor's committee for persons with disabilities. And this is a great committee, but it would be better served by having the superintendents and a staff member who is familiar with these issues related to persons with disabilities and what the school division has to offer. So the school board members do not have the most up-to-date information on these services, um, and this is bylaw 128 G3. So we are recommending also that we will, and when we come back to the committees, um, that we're recommending to take this one off of our list of committees. Any questions? Okay, Ms. Melnick. So as I listen to you um, give your explanation um, one, you know, in favor of adding two more people to this, uh, to the policy committee, um, I, cer I certainly will again state <laughs> we, we rarely have people who want to step up for extra committee work. So, um, technically we have 31 committees. That's how many committees we must share. And... Over the past couple of years, the policy committee, I, I would think the bulk of our very late night discussions happen with policies, as they should. Policies are, are, are really important. But it would be incredibly helpful if we had a good solid group of people, and I think in this case, five would be fantastic, who could really hash out this work um, and come to some consensus before it's brought to the full board. Um, it's important work. Um, not, not my favorite since we have nearly 800 policies and they must be reviewed frequently. Um, but I am absolutely not opposed to five people doing this work. And again, I applaud everyone who's willing to step up um, and do this work, and um, I have great faith in this group that um, that you will do gr do great work in a group of five. And for that reason, I will be voting in favor of that. Thank you, Miss Manning. So it's been said we have a lot of committees. Committee work is extensive. <clears throat> I actually believe we have way too many committees, um, and I believe that some people on this board. Um, are stretched pretty thin on those committees. Um, when the Governance Committee and the PPMC Committee were created, I didn't support that because I, did, I didn't think it was needed. And I, I especially didn't support having five members on our Governance Committee. Having almost half the school board um, on a committee, I, I just, I just why, why don't we just bring it to the full board and let us hash it out? I mean, I think it defeats the purpose of having smaller groups to work on the issues and bring it forward. Um, you know, the work that we do on PRC is important. Um, it, it's not extremely difficult. I mean, I, I've heard it's difficult, it's difficult. It, it's really not, you analyze, you, you have to study the work before you come to the meeting and you have to be prepared. But once we're in there, it's really not that difficult. So um, I, I do not support changing this bylaw um, and I, I also don't support doing this in the way we've done it. Um, this is the first time we've talked about this, uh, about doing this. It kind of came up out of nowhere when three of us, we, we had this argument, you know, five, six months ago over who was going to be on the PRC. And um, it, it's been stated by a board member that we have, we have two factions on this board. This was stated recently by a board member, and I agree, we do. And I'm going to just call it out for what it is. We have two factions. We have Democrats and we have Republicans. Every board member that's sitting up here ran as a Democrat or Republican or w was on the sample ballot of a political party. 
And when you do that, you tie yourself to that political party. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that's reality. And just like the legislature, when you're appointing committees, people who voted for you are looking at how you're going to vote on who to assign committees. And if you are part of a political party, that's what this is all about. This is all about the board doesn't want me and Ms. Brown on a committee because then we would be in the, in the majority. And this bylaw change, um, I, I, this, this change to this bylaw, to me, is to get around that by saying, oh, well, we're including you all. Well, we're still going to be in the minority. Um, it will still be three to two. Um, so I just, if that's what you want to do, if you want to exclude one of us from the committee, let's, let's just get to it and, and hash that out without having to change a bylaw to do it. Thank you. Okay, I need to respond to that as the chair, and I'm going to, because the chair and the vice chair just met on this. And this is not about what you just said. This is about there are five people that expressed the desire to be on this. This is not about Republicans and Democrats. And if anybody knows me, they know that that's true. This is about giving the opportunity for everyone that wanted to serve on this committee the opportunity to do it. And for you to turn that around with, your, with what you said, I disagree totally with that. And I do have to say that. Thank you very much. Ms. Franklin. Okay. So when we had the shift in the school board after the last election, we had a fairly large amount of our board change, um, you know, seats. And so we were put in a position where we had several vacancies on the committees. And being somebody who did vote for the PRC committee in the past, uh, for the current committee, I will tell you that I feel like good work has been done. Um, and But at the time, the reason I did not, uh, or I voted the way I did, was because it would have been unsettling to switch committees um, halfway through the term and then try to unseed and figure things out, you know, part, part of the way through. Unfortunately, that's just how our election cycle works, but, but that, is, um, that is how that came about at the time, because we did have several people at the time during the switch that would have had to either come off a committee, other people couldn't get on a committee, so it just made sense at the time to work the committee that way with people that were interested and, and create a situation where we filled those voids. And so I thought that that was a great, um, a great solution at the time. I also feel like, m me personally, and talking to, having been a newer board member, having come on to the committees, um, talking to some of the newer board members, there is a period of time where there is an acclimation period to, to get you know, acclimated to being on the board. This is this is uh, this is a you know good work, but it can be a lot of work, and th that you're trying to learn um, drinking through a fire hose at times, especially when you come on the board during election season or during budget season. So I just feel like having some stability in terms of um, having some senior members on the board. We have another election cycle coming up, like we've been told by the audience, and um, and so. You know, with that being said, there could be a situation where, again, we have members that are, are not as experienced in our PRC, um, uh, you know, work, for lack of a better term, but, you know, if, if what we do on the PRC board. So I like the fact that we're going to have senior members, and then we're going to have some newer members who are going to be able to you know, acquire some experience so that if some reason the senior members are no longer there with the new election cycle, we have other people that now have experience on the board and can move up to that senior role. Um, I think that's just the natural attrition of, of how committees and boards work. And um, for that reason, I do find that I would be supportive of the bylaw change. However, I do want to ask um, you, Madam Chair, 
is there a way, because there have been some people that were just notified about this, would it be a problem to go ahead and, I mean, I'm not, so I guess the next one would be during the retreat, is that right, or next meeting? I know we have a lot going on, but just out of respect for people to be able to kind of wrap their heads around, um, you know, this new bylaw change, is there a way that we could go ahead and push the committee assignment to the next That's the Cami question. You can. You're, uh, we did not schedule a policy review committee meeting in July because it would have fallen on the same week as the retreat. So I don't think it would do any damage to a policy review. I think part of the reason to bring it up to your attention was if it helped you make decisions about committees, you could have this discussion tonight. We recognize that there was a possibility that you might want to push this off. I, they want, what, when I was talking to the chair and the vice chair, they wanted to bring this to your attention that this was a possibility to think about if that helped you make decisions about committees. And what we also recognize that policy review committee is not scheduled in, in July right now, so it really wouldn't do any harm to push off if you want to do just this policy, or this, sorry, this committee. I don't think that does any harm. I actually, I don't think it does any harm for the mayor's committee either, where you're just more of a liaison to it. The point was to bring this to your attention to think about here's a way to solve the issue. And I do want to bring out your attention that part of the reason that I'm actually the one that suggested that this is a possibility to do, because we had a situation like this about two decades ago. We had a school board member who really, really wanted to be on audit committee, and we just, the way we worked out, we couldn't work it out. If you actually read how the internal audit committee reads, it says the internal audit committee consists of three or four members, including two or three members of the school board and one or more citizens. We actually drafted it that way, so we had the possibility to do that. That's how we solve that problem. Now, traditionally, we've had three, but when that particular board member was on a number of years ago, we actually had four. That's how they solve that problem. So it really, I will say, I'm actually the one that suggested this. I, you know, I know there's some allegations political. I know this is how we solved this problem about 17 or 18 years ago, uh, putting it on there. So it was a potential to do it that way. I, and again, that just my putting that out there. I don't know that it harms, if you're all right not putting through the policy review next month, I certainly don't see any reason why either one of those couldn't wait. Well, if, if that's the case, then I would like, I would request that we go ahead and move this um, committee assignment to and vote to uh, the next time. So that way we have an opportunity to just, you know, get in feedback, input, you know, okay. and, and figure that out. So. so Let's let our, our next uh, speaker speak, and then we'll move on. Ms. Um, Martin. Um, Madam Chair, respectfully, I'd like to point out that while I was endorsed by a particular party, I was also endorsed by Do the Right Thing, a conservative PAC headed up by uh, Republican Ron Villanueva, also endorsed by the conservative Hampton Roads Black Caucus. So as if you know me, 20 years in public service, um, I live and breathe policy, economic policy in my current job, uh, environmental policy in my prior position, also higher education policy as adjunct faculty at Old Dominion. Um, so to somehow say that I'm bipartisan uh, is partisan is is wrong. Um, to quote somebody who I respect very much, um, my politics are our students. Um, I've taught at ODU for 13 years. I decided to run for this board um, to make a difference in K through 12 education. Um, so I volunteered to uh, be part of this board, and I think it's really important that the junior members of the board start to learn these committees, because we do have an election uh, in 2024. My term goes all the way through the end of 2026, so I expect to have the opportunity in 25 to um, step up to chair positions as we go forward. And I feel like I have a really good relationship with other members of the board. Kathleen and I have great conversations. David and I meet for coffee. Mike and I talk sometimes. And Ms. Manning and I talk quite a bit. I even offered some compromise on the book policy. Um, it wasn't accepted by the PRC, but I am always looking for solutions. So I think I would be a really good addition to this board. Um, my uh, full-time job is going um, about 80% remote, so I'll be in Richmond about once a week, so I can take on these additional committee assignments if that um, comment about we're busy. Yes, we are, but we volunteered to do this, and I want to step up and do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Ms. Weems. Thank you. Well, as I wrote my colleagues an, an email this afternoon, um, this is 
this is a time when the chair and the vice chair agree to disagree in a very polite manner. I, I respect her effort and Cammie's to, to please everyone. I'm not sure that when we did this before, it was a solution. I argued very hard against adding, especially four people. I mean, if I had the choice, I would pick five over four because then you got a tie on the committee. But when we did this, you know, years ago, I was very much against it. I, I have, I just don't think it's reasonable to have half of a board on a committee. And the chair attends a lot of these committee meetings, you know, even though she doesn't, you know, at these, she's not supposed to say anything or, or she's just supposed to observe, I guess. That's, that's six people at this PRC meeting. So I just don't think it's, it's needed. I think all of the five can serve. I think all the five would do a good job, but I'm just like, let's vote three. And then next year, you know, pe people that have been on it for a while, give somebody else a turn. Um, there's two senior and one junior member on there now. Um, I don't see anything wrong with the three on there. And, and to have five on a committee, we're just going to be doing this. So next time, if five or six of us want legislative, let's have five. I don't know, maybe six. I want, you know, maybe next time six of us want to be on the legislative committee. Maybe I want to be on the PRC next time. I mean, when do we stop, stop it? We don't stop it at four. We don't stop it at three. Do we stop it at five? Maybe six. It's unnecessary. You can't please everybody. Everybody's going to get a chance. You don't have to get a chance your first or second time that you want a committee. There's been times when I've waited four, five, six years to get on a committee because you take turns. So five. Um, I, I just I do want to respond to that as well. This was a compromise that, that Mrs. Linetti, when speaking with her about what we were going to do with the committees, and I thought this was a, a fine compromise to bring the five people that had voiced their desire to be on this committee. And that's what, what Mrs. Weems and I were elected for, to compromise. To bring compromise to this board, because there's been so much disagreement. And so therefore, we talked about it and discussed it. Yes, Mrs. Weems said, I'm not sure I like that. That's a lot of people on a committee. However, and if those people were not available for that committee, and they didn't feel like they had the time, they would not have asked to do that. So I think, and, and, and I don't see where it's going to cause a problem to have five people on it. I think it would, I, I like what Ms. Um, Franklin said, I think it will help, and what Ms. Martin said, it will help our junior members that have just, you know, come on, to get more experience with it. Just as I know Mrs. Franklin mentioned that for PPMC. She said it was probably the committee that helped her the most of all the committees she's been on. And I know it's been voiced by a couple members that they didn't think PPMC was important or necessary. But it is, it's a, a committee that helps our newer members especially, and even me. I find out new things every time I go to a new committee meeting to help us understand the dynamics of the school board and what our jobs are. So I don't see where it's going to be a problem. Um, Ms. Melnick. Just one last comment. Uh, Mrs. Weems mentioned that she had to wait five or six years to get on a committee. That's not sharing the work. That's, that's kind of, um, you know, not, not dividing that equally and I just, I, I guess my question to, to my board is, if five people are willing to do the work, why don't we let five people do the work? You know, it, it could be one year, we don't have five people that want to be on the board. It doesn't have to state in policy or in a bylaw that five people have to serve on the policy committee. It could read up to five. Because I guarantee you there will come a time when we're not going to have five people who want to be on the policy committee. Yeah, I happened to serve on the audit committee on a committee of four. And I will say thank you to my colleagues on that board and our citizen. Um, it is probably the best committee I've ever served on besides legislative. It is, it is a fantastic working group. Um, and I would like to see that working group relationship continue. 
So I asked my colleagues, really truly consider the bylaw stating up to five. Ms. Manning. Yes, so a few years ago, um, <clears throat> we had some major discussions because I wanted to be on the audit committee. And um, the number wasn't increased for me to be on the audit committee when other people wanted to be on the committee. I actually would like to remain on the legislative committee. I didn't request it this time because I felt that it was going to be used against me and, not, and I wouldn't be allowed to be on the PRC because I was on the legislative because those were discussions that we had in the last meeting that if you were already a, on a major committee, you couldn't be on another one. So I would actually like to be on the legislative committee. So are we going to um, increase the number of that one as well? Are we going to increase every one that just because people want to be on it? I just don't think that that's the proper way to govern. Um, and I would ask the board to consider that um, an unintended consequence of moving forward. Thank you. Ms. Owens. Thank you. Uh, when I think about our policy committee, to me, that is the committee that <clears throat> truly drives uh, the work of the division, drives where we're going. Obviously, we all come together to vote on the policies, but our policies are driving the direction that we're going. And that committee seems like it would benefit from having more voices on the table or at the table there. It right now is a very homogenous group. It doesn't have voices that are reflective of our full community. We don't have any males. We don't have any minorities. We have three women over the age of 40 or whatever age they are, it's a very homogenous group. And so to turn down the opportunity to bring additional voices, additional perspectives, which is what our board is supposed to represent, seems really counterintuitive to the driving factor that the policy review committee brings for our division as a whole. I would welcome the opportunity to have additional voices represented. Thank you. Ms. Franklin. Um, just one last comment, and that is, we have not had a legislative update in a while, so I would be okay increasing the number of people on the legislative committee because we have not had um, an update about legislation in a long time that I can remember. So I would actually be okay with that because I think that Schedules do get busy, and uh, it would be very helpful to be able to know that we have um, communication in Richmond, so I would be in favor of that. Ms. Milnick. I'm sorry, and in response to that, that is a wonderful idea, putting five people on the legislative committee. It is incredible work. It's one I served on with Ms. Linetti, Ashley McLeod, Joel, Joel McDonald, and we got, we got a lot of work done on that committee. I'm waiting for a head nod from the attorney. It was yeah, <laughs> and Mrs. Weems chaired it. We did some really yep. great stuff. The General Assembly with Mrs. Weems and Mrs. Yes. Mel, like they it's been very active at other times. And there and a lot of work just kind of falls off the side of that boat. Um, there, there's a lot of room for improvement um, with that committee. It's kind of been. Um, less than lately, and I would love to see that increased. Um, I would love to see the communication between our legislators, and um, again, this body has the power to do that collectively, and if there are five people that would like to serve on that, please let our bylaws say up to five. Okay, so because, okay, I'll, I'll wait, Ms. Anderson. So <clears throat> it's been pointed out that um, having five people on the committee would bring five different perspectives. And, and I do believe that doing the work together with a committee of five would be more helpful. Um, as Ms. Riggs pointed out, by the time we get to this committee, where or this board, uh, where we have 11 different people, um, five is not too many when you have a board of 11. So five people doing all that work um, and 
com coming together in consensus and agreeing on policies, it will be very helpful. And I think this board deserves to have a committee that brings forth policy uh, that has been well versed with as many perspectives as five would bring. So I'm in favor of uh, having up to five on the committee if we could change that language to, to agree with that. Thank you. Ms. Martin, did you raise your hand or you, were you just pointing to Ms. Anderson? I'm not sure if now is the time to address the legislative committee. I'll wait. I, until I was going, going to update. address that. Well, okay. I'm happy to, to do that because I spoke with Joel two days ago. Well, not yet. Okay. Not yet. We're, we'll talk about that. Okay. So what I do, what um, Ms. Williams and I were up here discussing um, since that has come up, and there are two people, Mrs. Um, um, Manning did tell me that she, you know, would go off of the uh, legislative like she just mentioned a minute ago. And so that was empty. I asked her for sure if that's what she wanted to do. She said she was trying to give other people the opportunity. Um, Mrs. Um, Melnick stepped up and said she wanted to do it. So if, and now Ms. Manning is saying she'd like to stay on it. So this is another committee that we're discussing tonight if we would want to go ahead and put five people on that. So we obviously can do that and bring that back and take these two committees, including the um, Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities, we'll bring these back to the next meeting, which is the first meeting, um, the adjusted meeting that we have after our retreat. I think it's the 11th of um, July, and we'll bring it back to, for those three. Okay, and then also tonight what we'll do is go ahead and just, you know, we'll give you the list, I think you guys got it, of the rest of the committees and we'll vote on them. Are we okay with that? Madam Chair, may I clarify, you would like under bylaw 128 for the policy review to read up to five members or five members and same thing for legislative, up to five members? Up to five members. And then just the, the I think that I think that makes it fair. Up to five members. Madam Chair. Yes. So, clarification: We will bring back the bylaw vote, and then that will then determine the PRC vote and the legislative vote. Those three we're bringing back, and also the mayor's committee. Okay, and the mayor's committee, and then everything else we will vote on tonight as presented besides those committees, is that correct? Yes, that's okay, correct. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Brown. So when I submitted my requests, I submitted them based on three-person committees, and so I would like to see if this bylaw um, has enough votes to pass before I determine to submit any additional committees that I'm interested in, so I think that it would be fair that we vote on the bylaw at our next meeting since it wasn't on the agenda and then vote on our committee assignments the following meeting so that everybody has the opportunity to make their requests for the committees if um, that bylaw pass, passes. So that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Hold on. What I do want to check, Mrs. Brown, um, the rule on carryover committees. Some of your committees are fine. I'm worried a little bit like student discipline. Um, I don't know that we have any scheduled at the beginning of July. I just want to make sure check when the rules I think you get the committee stays on if we haven't appointed new people but I don't want you to have a committee that has to do something you don't have a committee hold on a second I think it might be an appendix C. I think what we might, I think what we would probably do, if I can't find it specifically in here, I think the chair has the authority to appoint folks to a committee. So there's any chance the committee's in there, but I would like to look at that a little bit more carefully. I'm, I'm trying to think between now and the next, um, it's really July 1 to July 11th, I think would be your problem. And I don't know that we would have student discipline because that's July 4th week. I've just, that's one of those committees I worry about. But I think if that was a concern, that the chair would be able to point three people to a student discipline committee, we would just manage it that way. I think Mr. McGee informed us that we would not be having any, that we had our last ones um, this past week, and nothing has been said about the July. Yes, Ms. Owens. My understanding is that there were none scheduled, but there's summer school going on right now, and so if something happens, 
they'd still have the right to appeal and right. time frame for that. I don't see any of the committees that concern me that wouldn't, that would need to happen between now and July 11th. I think we're okay. I think we would just fall back on if we don't have somebody, if we don't have a committee established that the chair would then be able to appoint people to fill in. But again, I think because you've got the July 4th week as the first week of July, we probably are going to see a lot more vacations. We wouldn't anticipate committee meetings that week. So I think we're okay. Ms. Williams. Okay, with Ms. Brown's suggestion, so now are we talking about voting on the bylaw change at our next meeting, which is the bridge meeting, the retreat, and then the following meeting so people can then see if there's space open, because we don't know if the bylaw change is gonna pass or not. So then two weeks following that, we will actually be voting on these three committees. Is that correct? Well, because, I mean, I don't see how we're going to vote on both, like Ms. Brown said, the same time, if we don't know. If I mean, is there, Cami, I mean, Ms. Linetti, is there a problem with voting on the bylaw at the retreat meeting and then the committees the following school board meeting? It's just going to leave a whole month where you may yeah. not have any work done uh, as opposed to just two weeks on there. Again, I think we would have to look at the same thing. I was going to try to pull up Appendix C to see if that talks about the committee stuff. That right. was my only concern is do you have any committees that meet? I want to say it's July 25th is your second Right, meeting. yeah, it's July 25th. Our other is to vote on, vote on it all during the retreat meeting, but we won't know if the bylaw passes, and if it doesn't pass, it's all, it doesn't matter anyway. So I don't know who's going to sign up for what, or a five-person committee. I, mean, I, I think it's up to you. You just need to, and again, what I was looking for is Appendix C, which is what I think actually happens with the carryover, where we spell what happens with the carryover committees if, if we don't have anybody appointed. It's just up to you. You just need to know that if you go to the end of July and you need a committee that meets, you may have to have a temporary appointment. I don't think we need to go to the end of the July. I think we need to go ahead and vote on that bylaw and go ahead and, and vote on the committees. I think we just I need to we need to move on. The committees need we've discuss this. I don't know how many people are, are, I don't have my list of people that gave me their times they wouldn't be here and when they would, but I think it's time to go ahead and make the decision and vote on that at the next meeting. I think putting it off one meeting is good and we've let, we've given you that opportunity, everyone that has voiced their concern and their desire and I think that that's well enough, so. So if you want to be on the legislative committee, let Ms. Riggs know, mm -hmm. and then if there's space for five, up to five, if the bylaw passes, that's fine, and if not, we'll stick to the three. Okay. And some committees will still have three. Yeah, yeah. most committees will. It's just those two that we're talking about right and now. PRC. They're the only two, and that's the only two we're gonna do it. Now, um, Ms. Manning was talking about it being a, a lot of committees, and there are a lot. So Mrs. Um, Weems and I have talked about, yes, there are a lot, and we, we didn't want to bring too much to you guys about changing it. That's why we only looked at the one, the Remove the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities. Um, we thought we'd talk about that, you know, later on, but right now that, and, and look at our other committees to see if there's more that we need to look at and see if we can whittle down, okay? You have a question, Ms. Melnick? So I, I sit on committees where staff members attend the meetings. Um, it's kind of a feelings person too. It's, a, it's a, been a long standing committee and I hate for it, for a board member to disappear from that committee when they report back to the, to the board and to the public about that committee. So is it a committee that a staff member and a board member can, can attend together? 
so that then that work can be shared with the board and the community, or is it one that is better served by only a staff member? Well, we talked about it, and you know, we can ask Dr. Spence if he wants to weigh in on it, but we talked about it with Mrs. Linetti, and um, we were talking about what they come back with, and I know, I, Mrs. Williams, you've been on that committee, right? Okay, okay, and, and so if we have an administrator serve on that committee, they can come back and report to us in a presentation. So that's what we were talking and discussing. Any other questions? Mrs. Okay. Reed, I do want to clarify, for you under Bylaw 128, I did find it under subsection three, assignment second, um, second paragraph, should one or more school board need to attend a meeting prior to school board adoption of committee assignments, the chair is authorized to temporarily appoint school board members to the committee. Assignments school board committees are effective to do 30 or until such time as the school board appoints new committee members, whichever is later. So your, your committees would carry over if that was the concern. Ms. Weems. And then also with the mayor's committee, I've attended it several times because I've known people who were being recognized. We can still go. I mean, you know, it's just going to be staff to report by, but any of us can go. Um, so, okay. So, what you found is that we will just carry over our committees until we vote on the new committees, the new assignments. Yes. Okay. So, is everybody in agreement to do what uh, we just discussed about bringing? all of the committees back and not voting on them tonight. Do I have anyone that is against that? So, um, we will look at the action part of the agenda where we vote on the committees, which is um, um, 15B, and we will take that off and bring that back to the next meeting on the 11th of July. Are we good? <laughs> and then in the meantime, point, point of order, we'll need to vote on that when yeah, you get I know, down I to know. that. Okay. And in the meantime, make sure, like Mrs. Weems said, to, uh, if you have a desire to be on the PRC committee, if you're, you know, someone that didn't tell me, are the legislative, please let me know. So, do I have a motion? Can, can I just clarify though? We are voting on the bylaw change at the retreat, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna vote at, okay, thank you. I just, yes, we will vote on the bylaw change 128 at the retreat and vote on the um, committee assignments. Okay? Well, I'll make a motion. So, Mrs. Um, be uh, Ms. Anderson, would you make the motion? I'll make the motion that we uh, vote on the bylaw changes at the June 11th, I mean, I mean July 11th meeting, and then um, vote on the committee assignments on the July 25th meeting. Both of them, both of them are on the July 11th. Both of them on the yes, July Yes, both 11th. of them are on July 11th. Okay, so I make a motion that we vote on the committee assignment, the bylaw changes and the committee assignment we're, for uh, on July 11th. Madam Chair, I, I think we're out of order um, because we haven't even gotten to the action items yet and we don't have to vote on information. Okay, we can, oh, okay. We can wait till then. I'll hold it. I'll hold, my, hold it. my motion. Thank you. I thought we were, we were ready for the motion. But I'll hold that. Okay. So let's return, let's go back to, um, we will bring that back to our action where we do the votes. And now we're back to public comment. Okay, Madam Chair, our next speaker will be Joseph Kahn, Carol Kinsey, and then Amanda Smith. Good evening. My name is Joseph Kahn III. Thank you for the chance to uh, finally get to address you. 
Um, I'm a lawyer and I serve as the Director of Public Policy at Family Policy Alliance. We're a national pro-family organization that empowers parents to protect their children through public policy. But I'm not here in that capacity tonight, I'm off the clock. I'm here as a lifelong Virginia Beach resident and a graduate of Salem High School. And I'm deeply concerned about this board's actions towards parents and vulnerable children, actions that I can only conclude are extremely dangerous. Parents have the constitutional right to direct the upbringing of their children, including the right to make all healthcare decisions regarding them. The Supreme Court of the United States has reaffirmed this right many times. But this board has signaled that it is determined to deny parents their rights by not requiring that parents be notified by teachers and school employees immediately when their child expresses confusion about their, their uh, sexuality. Conversely, teachers and school administrators are being told by national unions that they must not inform parents when this happens, but must instead affirm a child's self-professed gender identity by calling them by new names and pronouns, letting them wear, oppos or letting them wear opposite sex clothing, and even allowing them to use bathrooms and changing rooms of the opposite sex. This is deeply dangerous to both children in our schools and to teachers and school administrators. I'll tell you why. It's dangerous to children because a mountain of evidence shows that when children are begun down the path of so-called gender transition, over 90% of them will follow through with that transition, all the way to its painful, irreversibly damaging and sterilizing result, which you saw here tonight, sex change surgeries, such as double mastectomies on healthy breasts. This is because social transition is increasingly being recognized as a non-neutral medical intervention. And this is why it's dangerous for school employees. It exposes them to potential liability for two separate accusations. First, the accusation that they have denied parents their constitutional rights by preventing them from being involved in the healthcare decision of whether or not to socially transition their children. And the second ac accusation is that they have practiced healthcare without the proper licenses by facilitating that social transition. Surely our parents, children, and teachers deserve better than this. No child is born in the wrong body. And this is proven by the immense evidence that most children with gender dysphoria who are not started down the path of transition grow out of that dysphoria 30 seconds. by the time they reach adulthood. This makes all these medical interventions completely unnecessary. So this board must change course immediately. You have to empower parents to exercise their right to direct the upbringing of their children. And you must not waste our tax dollars by enacting policies that deny parents their rights and result in costly litigation that you will ultimately lose. I urge you to be good stewards of the power and wealth the people of Virginia Beach and God Almighty have entrusted to you and national efforts like uh, national experts like myself are available. And to that you is everyone. time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Kinsey, Amanda Smith, then Jamie Bagwell. Good evening. First of all, I do not apologize for my Christian faith nor my views. Sometimes some adults don't get it right because their minds are clouded by the present worldly views and whims of the culture, the trends, what is pushed and glorified in America. Sometimes some of the powers that be don't see the consequences of their votes and choices, what they will lead to in the future. On one hand, you all say you listen and include parents when really you're keeping secrets from them and only listening to the parents who agree with you. On one hand, you're for all the students, but then you force upon the majority, the voices of the minority, confusing and endangering the mental and emotional health of those students. Leadership is not being in charge. It's about taking care of all of those in your charge. On one hand, you want inclusiveness and no discrimination, but yet you don't include all students in a resolution. On one hand, you want all books included in our libraries, but would you have read the passage Miss Manning had read at the last school board meeting to your kindergartners, Miss Riggs? Your first graders, Miss Melnick? 
or in all your 36 years of teaching, Ms. Anderson, to any of your students? You are not experts in teaching our students morality. Parents are to make sure their children are taught values and truth. On one hand, you preach decorum, yet you allow people of faith to be mocked for the last two meetings, at least. And you called an online speaker, you called an online speaker profanity. Rudeness is not intellect. Some of you need to reconnect with your public. Elevate the standards of what is accepted and focus on the academics and the standards of discipline. Ask yourselves what kind of school system you are leaving our children and grandchildren, please. Our next speaker is Amanda Smith, then Jamie Bagwell. Speaker 37 had to cancel, and then it would be Erica Strickler. Amanda Smith. Uh, Jamie Bagwell. evening. So I see I can't adjust the mic, so this is fun. Um, thank you, school board, for your service. I know it's challenging to listen to public comments, so thank you. Um, many school board members have a one-sided narrative of the issue of parental rights and gender identity. We urge them to consider the equally important perspective of teens and families, which have been represented here tonight. They've and They've experienced real harm from the policies that have cut parents out of the process. Please protect this generation, starting with implementing Governor Youngkin's guidelines. I know it's hard to change a public position. It probably feels like you can be surrounded by opposition. However, if and when you have the courage to change your position publicly, You'll find many allies, not friends per se, but allies, and a different kind of political strength. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erica Streckler, Chuck Boyer, and then Virginia Wasserberg. My name is Erica Steckler. I'm a former middle school teacher, Teach for America alumni, and mother. I'm here this evening to advocate for my daughter and the other children affected by the ODS selection process this year. My fellow parents have already spoken tonight to give background, impact, and possible solutions. So I'd like to take my three minutes to review relevant policy. According to the Virginia Beach School Board Policy, Section 6-31, it is the policy of the school board to actively promote and develop a qualitatively differentiated educational program for gifted learners in order to facilitate the fullest development of their potential. The program shall be in compliance with the Virginia Plan for the Gifted, as approved by the Virginia Board of Education. This plan states, the goal of the selection process used at ODS is to select the top candidates from those who apply. The following components are used in this decision-making process. Student achievement, standardized test scores, teacher information, GRT information. Nowhere in the approved plan does it say a lottery can be used in this decision-making process. In fact, during a 2020 school board meeting, a representative asked, I'm assuming that in a lottery, there are students that do meet your qualifications, but there's no room. Then director of gifted programs, Nicole DeVries stated, we don't currently have a lottery system in Virginia Beach schools. If the committee rated too many students of four, then spots available, there were two options supported by the plan. Go back, number one, go back through the applications and use the listed components to further differentiate students. Number two, offer admission to all students the committee deemed as needing more than what is provided through the resource cluster program at their home schools. 
In fact, Virginia Administrative Code 8 VAC 20-40-40 Section E states, if a student is identified as gifted and eligible for services, the Identification and Placement Committee shall determine which service options most effectively meet the addressed learning needs of that student. The Selection Committee determined that 244 students need ODS, and yet 130 130 students were offered full-time gifted services, while the other 114 equally deserving students are forced to settle for part-time gifted services at their home schools. If the administration wanted to add a lottery to the plan, they should have gone through the proper channels for amending the plan. This means proposing revisions to the school board, allowing for public comment, and finally a vote by the school board before implementation. This is the procedure. These are the checks and balances put in place to ensure that there isn't an abuse of power and or the pushing of an individual's personal agenda. It is now seconds. the school board's legal responsibility to hold the administration accountable for not following the policies as written. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chuck Boyer and then Virginia Wasserberg. Gender policy, um, thank you to all the school board members for having listening ears to know what we the public are thinking and believing about school resolutions and policies with Virginia Beach City Public Schools. All the children, the much younger and into teens are very much sacred human lives to be cherished and treated equally and fair. Thus the school board must always work toward being indivisible not divided as much as possible to protect all children and always grant full access and transparency to parents. Parental authority should be an easy and essential yet critical principle to recognize and respect, especially in regards to life-changing decisions and more situations with children. Section 1-240.1 of the Virginia Code says a parent has a fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education, and care of the parent's child. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Our next speaker is Virginia Wassenberg. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to be clear that um, I'm not a resident of Virginia Beach, so nobody really needs to look that up, and I appreciate the inclusivity of the board for allowing me to speak here this evening. Um, I'm here tonight as a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm here tonight as a woman, and that's defined as an adult human female. I'm here tonight as a wife, and I occasionally need my husband to help me do things like open jars, because God made us biologically different. I'm also here tonight as a mother. Let's not confuse that. I'm not a birthing person. I'm a mother. But I'm also an American. That's right. And we are one week away from the 247th anniversary and birth of our great country. Yet I don't see a resolution on your agenda tonight to celebrate that or to honor that. Now, it has been said that you spent eight to nine months crafting a resolution to honor what is about 0.5% of the population of the United States. How much time did you spend to honor the brave men and women that sacrificed their freedom for your freedom? Or how about the students that are in these schools, in this military town, whose family members are right now serving this nation? Where's the resolution to honor them? Where is it? Why wasn't that done? That, that's a question I asked myself. And then I remembered how the chair of, of this committee, this, this board, once called our beautiful flag, Old Glory, she called it a piece of cloth. That's what she called it. And I remembered how this administration barred a veteran from entering a meeting because he wanted to carry an American flag into this meeting. And then what happened was the unthinkable. 
this chair of this board allowed someone to make a comment to an African American Navy veteran, a slur on him after he did seconds. something, and none of you did anything about it. So that could be why you don't have a resolution honoring our great country, because your priorities are wrong, and because there is an explicit bias on this dais. Ms. Manning, you were right. Thank you. That was our last in-person speaker. We will move on to our online speakers. Our first speaker is Dan Chang. Please unmute. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, welcome. Happy Independence Day. I mentioned this as a first-generation American whose parents were immigrants arriving speaking only Chinese. They were grateful to be here in the United States, the greatest nation on earth. My daughter once asked my father what he thought about striving to succeed in, in spite of racism. He scoffed at the question, telling her that nowhere else on earth could a peasant from China become an admiral in the greatest Navy. I mention this because when reviewing the agenda, I failed to see Mrs. Owens and Mrs. Franklin's resolution honoring our country this Independence Day, nor yours, Mrs. Riggs, where are they? We spent the entire academic year of school board meetings driven by desires of students focused on one issue and the board has played along, actually using these students politically. They were complimented and coddled throughout, throughout just showing, for just showing up. Then they were given their own trophy, a resolution as a reward. They almost were given another trophy, a seat on the board. It appalls me that the majority of the board fell in line with this game constantly citing non-scientific statements of the Trevor Project. Has the Trevor Project reached out to Chloe for further, for a fuller picture of what medical and surgical transition truly is? Did they put her story on their webpage? No, they would, that would destroy their and your political narrative. In the meantime, this board fought against the removal of pornography in the schools, ignored academic failures, graduated unprepared students, shut its eyes to the fentanyl crisis and behavioral issues, proposed outrageous amounts of tax money on school rebuilds. Mrs. Riggs' board also managed to insult publicly at a school board meeting a Black Navy veteran, Jerome Bell, who disagrees with Mrs. Riggs. Pat yourselves on the back. Does Mrs. Riggs think this past year's activity showed leadership? That's a question. She unwisely supported the political philosophy of transgenderism, which encourages medical and surgical practices on children, but, but she lacks the intellectual capability or backbone to identify who denigrated Jerome Bell at the last meeting. There were only two hot mics, Mrs. Riggs. If Mrs. Riggs is unable to identify to the public and Chief Bell, the person who slurred him on mic, then she is a failure and should resign 30 seconds. the board. Unless she does this, she has no credibility as chair or on the board. God bless America, and I am proud to be in this country. Thank you. Our next online speaker is Paula Chang. Please unmute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you. On January 10th, Trenace Riggs was elected chair of the Virginia Beach City Public School Board. When Carolyn Weems, who was expected to accept the nomination as chair, instead nominated Riggs, Carolyn Weems noted that Riggs would, and these are quotes, work hard to unify this board, unquote. She defined Riggs as, and these are quotes, approachable, one who listens, and one who will conduct business in a fair and thoughtful manner. Weems further stated that Riggs would, quote, facilitate meetings so that we can once again be proud to be sitting here. Hmm. I spoke that night in opposition to Mrs. Riggs, reminding the board of the actions of Trenace Riggs the previous two years, actions which closed schools, weakened parental rights, forced masks, spoke to the press against the public, shut down community and parents, and decreased the quality of education. Two viewpoints. Turns out I was correct. She is unfair. We currently watch her play politics again with committee assignments. And also let's look at the ODS mess. And also, shall we look at this past school board meeting for proof of her unfairness? Again, students were allowed to take over and monopolize the meetings. 
Riggs allowed the board to use the valuable resources and time on a political stunt of a resolution based on dangerous, unproven political theories without any scientific long-term peer-reviewed studies. And we heard tonight from Chloe exactly how dangerous this is. This lawsuit-averse board should pay attention to the increasing lawsuits on this issue in the media, if you haven't noticed. Riggs is rude and abrupt to her board colleagues, who she disagrees with. Look at her treatment of Kathleen Brown, who properly presented a secondary resolution at the last meeting. Mrs. Riggs was nasty about it. Yet Mrs. Riggs previously showed preference to Mrs. Owens in her transgender resolution by putting it on the agenda without the resolution being completed and attached to the agenda. And I FOIA'd about this and received no, or I asked Mrs. Riggs about this, received no response. After that last meeting, Mrs. Riggs attempted to intimidate a concerned member of the public who emailed the board by requesting the address of the person who emailed the board. At the last meeting, the ultimate example of Mrs. Riggs' disdain for the citizens who opposed her is when she called herself or allowed another member of the board to call a black veteran conservative speaker a vulgar slur. Afterwards, she, who is the chair, seemed to find it just too difficult to demand the perpetrator, perhaps even herself, step forward and be held accountable. Mrs. Riggs should step aside as chair at a minimum due to her unwillingness to be fair to all. Further, as she finds it too difficult to identify the board member, who spoke the slur, perhaps it was herself who slurred the gentleman, she instead runs a cover up and therefore should resign. So I asked Mrs. Weems, will you be nominating or voting for Mrs. Riggs as chair again in January 24? Has she fulfilled all you promised us when you nominated her? Thank you. And that is time. Our next speaker is Jerome Bell. Please unmute. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, God bless to Ms. Blair and Chloe. And I see that your fearless leader has uh, vacated the premises um, to show that she's the coward that she is. On June 12th, the last time I spoke here after waiting five hours, I invoked my privilege as afforded to me by the bylaws of the Virginia Beach School Board and the United States Constitution to exercise my right to free speech concerning Mrs. Owens' resolution. It is the duty of the elected and position appointed officials to listen tentatively to what the constituents have to say, uh, whether you agree or disagree with their opinion. It is not the responsibility of any member to ridicule, shut up, or name call any speaker, especially with a vulgarity directed at a citizen after speaking. Last week, that citizen was me, and I believe, and I was also told by members of the board sitting next to you that the whispering of calling me, and I quote, an asshole, was that of Chair Riggs, Trenise Riggs. I have sent a letter to each of you through the school board email and have really, truly only received one personal response, and that was from Jen Jennifer Franklin. Even though we do not agree at all, I appreciate your contact, even though your premise is a false one. I have yet to receive any correspondence from the chair, but she did find a way to respond to Vic Nichols his uh, email, but why not mine? Mrs. Anderson responded to Mrs. Baker's email, but not to me. Why is that? Why wouldn't you respond to the person with the accusations instead of other citizens? I will tell you why. Because Mrs. Riggs is guilty and actually ashamed that she left her microphone on for the second time as a member of this board. Every one of you up there has heard the audio, and everyone surely knows who it is without a doubt, because you all spend so much time together. Just like everyone else, we've heard Trinace whisper before about how she'll be drunk by then in regards to listening to public comments also on a hot mic. What should have taken place was a personal apology, if not from you personally, Mrs. Riggs, that's not there, I'm speaking to your chair now, from the position of the chair that you should be sitting in at present listening, you should have responded to me first to at least say you will look into the matter. Not tell another constituent that the matter is closed and there will be no further investigation. 30 seconds. On the contrary, their investigation is already under progress whether you like it or not. If the culprit had even thought to be Vicki Manning and she called a black man an asshole, she would have been uh, crucified and labeled as a racist and there will, would have been 200 people here speaking. A couple of last things. Mrs. Anderson, when I speak, and I can assure you I'm always alone in a secluded area and there is no way possible someone on my end 
called me an asshole like you suggested. Thank you very much. Ms. Owens' resolution is still bullshit. And that is time. Asshole out. Our next speaker is Dottie Holtz. Please unmute. Good evening, Virginia Beach School Board members and Dr. Spence. My name is Dottie Holtz, a former teacher, a former school board member, and a grandparent of a student in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. I want to emphasize public schools. This, is, this city is my home. My family lives and loves here, and we have a vested interest in what happens here in our schools. Many here tonight do not. They have been summoned here tonight by external forces to spread seeds of discontent and chaos in our community. Please don't allow that to happen. Ignore them. I really came here tonight to talk about the um, PRC committee. I did, a, I, so I will have to change my remarks a little. I did appreciate the discussion about how, having a five member PRC committee. I also wanted to get on that committee when I was on the school board, and I also wanted to be on the legislative committee. I never had that opportunity. I was told I wasn't experienced enough. I agree with adding five people, but I do not agree that Ms. Manning should be one of them. She does not need to be on the committee. She does not believe in public education. And in signing her to the policy review committee in January, that was a huge blunder. Every one of you members, when you were elected, you vowed to stand up for the goals and the visions of Virginia Beach schools. Ms. Manning has caused resentment in our community. She's brought negative publicity to our schools. You and the public have paid dearly because of the wasted time and efforts and because of her political, personal, her cultural agenda. Look at her actions. Listen to her words. She has brought litigation against the school board. Yep, everyone doesn't know that, but she has sued the school board twice. And both of these actions failed. There was no retraction, no apology. These frivolous lawsuits have cost administrators and taxpayers time and money. Are you hearing that taxpayers? She's cost you money. Even now today, she is encouraging a group of ODC parents to use this platform to sue the seconds. school system. Incredible. Please kick her off that committee. She does not even belong on the school board. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vic Nichols. Please unmute. I agree with Vicki Manning on the party line ideology votes with one exception. Ms. Owens made a comment about a lack of diversity, yet disabled voices were removed from a committee. DEI never includes the handicapped. Why is that? Kids are out of school. Why aren't they here speaking? Why are they even speaking first? They don't go to bed at 9 p.m. even during school. They're all the same viewpoint at prime time rather than later time when the taxpayer parents that pay for this have to speak. That's viewpoint discrimination. A great number of people objected to the profanity Jerome Bell was called after his speech, or mics are cut after speaking. Mr. Bell was victim blamed rather than the responsible party owning up. Why does my personal home address matter? I don't possess a place to live or stay out of state where there might be questions. You know who I'm referring to. It only matters for elected officials like those who want my personal information. The fact is I pay taxes in some way, shape, or form, both local or state, that support the school system. And I've had family and friends, kids in the Virginia Beach school system that I care for very much. They're a little bit afraid to speak out because of retaliation. And I know what that's like. We're constantly lectured that attempts to age restrict books promoting alphabet ideology or censorship and must be resisted. But when it comes to a Christian themed publisher, the taxpayer funded American Library Association is promoting strategies to its members on how to deny permission for events where parents gather to read books published by them being held in public spaces that libraries provide for meetings. On June 8th, Deborah Caldwell Stone, a director at ALA, spoke at Library 2023 Worldwide Virtual Conference. Her presentation was how libraries could exploit loopholes to block conservative story hours. This is why we're concerned about books. In Germany, BDSM youth 
a nonprofit group had a booth at a Pride event, event in Munich. Pro-pedophilia Dutch activists were sentenced to prison just recently for possession of child abuse materials. Another reason we're concerned. Four in 10 transgender criminals are in prison. 42% actually is the number. They're in jail for sex crimes. That is why we're concerned over transgender people. With respect, there is a lot of mental health issues. And one article that I seconds. saw had 80 to 85% having other issues on there, not just being transgender. We are concerned. We have a right to be. Thank you. Hi, Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. So we are now on consent agenda. Citizens Advisory Committee appointment recommendations. We um, received that information um, last at our last meeting. And so this is a consent. B, Green Run Collegiate Charter Renewal. We received that information at our last meeting as well. It's a very thick packet. C, recommendations of the general contractor for Birdneck Elementary School seal and replacement. D, school board organizational matters. Su superintendents does one, superintendents designee in the absence of the superintendent. Two, superintendent signature authority. And three, payroll deductions. <coughs> E is, that's for action. So 15. Point of order, Madam Chair, we need to do um, a motion and a second for the consent items. Yeah, we knew, I'm sorry. We need to do, I need a uh, motion for the consent agenda. Ms. Franklin and a second by Ms. Weems. Um, are, is there any discussion? Ms. Melnick. Um, Mrs. Linetti, I'm assuming that um, the, the changes that I brought forward at the last meeting for the Green Run Charter have been amended. The ones that we put in involved the changing the academy, the name academy Names. on there. We found there was a mistake in a, a, one of the labeling, one of the attachments on there, a couple other ones. There was one section that had to do with the state code section that we did not agree on. So okay. we felt we would leave it at this point so we could get it passed and we would go back and talk with the GRC Academy uh, Foundation afterwards. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, hearing none, I call for a vote. Please raise your hands on a vote for the consent agenda. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Uh, we are now on 15 action, a personnel report, administrative assignments. Appointments, excuse me. Is there any discussion on that? Or a motion first? So moved. Seconded, moved by Ms. Melnick, seconded by Ms. Franklin. Now is there any discussion? Ms. Melnick. Um, Dr. Spence, as, um, as we move through the summer, should we be expecting more um, movement or are we at the end of that now? Um, we're not at the end of that, but there certainly will be a little bit more. There's always sort of dominoes, so action you take tonight may lead to some additional action. Um, but we've, we've, the, the docile team has done a nice job. We've come a long way in terms of tackling appointments and vacancies. Ms. Manning. Yeah, so I'm not going to be able to support these appointments because there are three new administrative positions being created. And um, I've made it very clear over the last couple of years that when we have a reduction of student population and we even um, 
had to eliminate 15 teaching positions um, recently, so I can't support adding new administrative positions when we have a, re a reduction of students and teachers. Thank you. So just to offer clarity, the appointments that you're voting on are not new. There isn't one of them that's new. What you received were reassignments. One of the reassignments was to, um, uh, and so you're not voting on those. One of those was into a position which was in the CON and voted on in the budget. Another one of those um, was in human resources. That was an employee relations position. That was two existing positions in human resources which were closed in order to create that new position based on Mrs. Woodhouse's assessment that we need more support in employee relations given the number of issues that we're dealing with. And the third position was the conversion of a teaching position into a teacher assistant position. No budget um, issue there because that is a um, like position. So you're not voting on any of those this evening. Those are reassignments. What you're voting on are appointments for existing positions. So I'm hopeful, at least if you're um, not voting on this, that you, you recognize what you're not voting on. Okay, so can you help me understand? Because um, I, I'm having trouble seeing the difference here in the reassignments and the appointments because um, in the appointment list that we have, it has, for example, um, a, the position of um, administrative assistant moving to assistant principal, and that's considered an administrative recommendation that we're voting on, but then in the other one, it has a teacher moving to an administrative assistant position, and that's not one that we're voting on, is what you're saying? That's correct. How is that different? How is that's one a reassignment in a, because... That's What's the from, difference? That's from like position to like position. That's a reassignment. Teacher to an administrative assistant? Administrative assistants are teaching positions. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't. That's why you're voting tonight, for example, as you just mentioned, an administrative assistant to assistant principal as a promotion. Okay. So it's a lateral for a, for a teacher to administrative assistant? That is a lateral move. That's okay. why you have consistently in your time on the board gotten reassignments when you okay. have, when we put teachers into teacher assistant positions. They're, they're reassignments. Okay. Thank you for that sure. clarification. I had attempted to ask that question via email, and thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. Mr. Callan. <clears throat> I don't mean to belabor something, but uh, I understand Mrs. Manning's perspective, Dr. Spence, that uh, when you look at the information that was provided to us, it does indicate that on three of the assignments, it does refer to them as a new position, giving that impression. So uh, like Ms. Manning, I, I hear you, and yet I'm looking at something and it's causing me to have a disconnect. Yep, so, so they, they are, the reassignments are into those positions. Those are lateral moves into positions. One of those positions was in the budget that you all approved. Another one of those is just a, re a, re a conversion of a teaching allocation into that administrative assistant position. And the other one was a conversion of two existing positions in human resources, one I believe in the substitute office and another one, actually I can't recall, I think I wanna say clerical. Um, and those two were closed because the assessment in that office was that we needed an additional employee relations specialist. That actually resulted in savings for the division. So those, and then the folks that are going into those positions are reassignments. They're, so they're, they're, not, they're lateral moves and they don't require board approval. What requires board approval are promotions. Do you understand the confusion though when you see it referred to as a new position with an answer of yes? I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the confusion other than the confusion between a reassignment and, a, and an administrative appointment. So what the board votes on are appointments. And the appointments are the three that you have here, which is the principal for Pembroke Elementary School, assistant principal for Larkspur Middle School, and assistant principal for Corporate Landing. The other positions are reassignments, so they're lateral moves. Reassignments are made regularly by the superintendent. That, that's a regular, you get almost every week, you get a memo about reassignments. Okay. Ms. Brown? Okay, so um, 
Mm. I'm going to support this, but I, um, I do also, since it's come up, I, I do believe that we have a bloated administration, and so I, I'm going to go ahead and make another plug for that again. Um, I know that we um, passed a budget and um, that these were potentially in that budget, and I understand everything you're saying, but I just wanted to make sure for the public that I explained um, that. Thank you. I guess um, I'll just say one time, because uh, I feel like I, I need to defend the administrative perspective here a little bit. I recognize that will be a budget conversation for the next superintendent to have with you all. That said, I, I hope when you go to have it that you have more than a suspicion and that you have specific examples that you can you know, point to and walk, your, walk through where you find, because I think you used the word duplication one time, where you find duplication or bloat. I don't believe that's the case. I've spent nine years trying to ensure that we're as efficient as we can be, that we have not expanded our central office and our administration. When we do expand it, it's either for mandated reasons or we've tried to put them into schools that need support as they've grown. So I, I actually disagree with your assessment and I hope as you go through that discussion with a new administration that you come with very specific uh, understanding of what, what, what that means and, and explanation and um, you know, what positions you're concerned about. Ms. Melnick. Um, I also would, would just like to say that I think communication matters, and I think that um, this right here shows um, just a lack of just picking up the phone and calling somebody and asking questions. And, and, and I asked this board to pick up the phone or stop by and visit an administrator that's spending 60, 70 hours a week at their job before we just arbitrarily assigning the word bloated in front of administration. Um, go visit a school where you're not there to walk. Go visit this summer and sit down and have a conversation with a principal and ask what a typical day is like. What is a typical week like? Tell me about your job before we start being so accusatory. It, it, it's, it, it's really just, it, it's really quite unfair to this division. Ms. Martin. Um, I can support these. Number one is I'm seeing a focus on improving middle school, which is something that we all agree needs to happen um, with some additional principals and, and more experienced administrators at the middle school level. And this employee relations uh, position is particularly important as we look at teacher retention. As I look at those exit surveys, I'm seeing about 18% of our teachers are leaving for careers in other industries. And that is of grave concern to me. That's one out of every five. Um, so absolutely support this employee relations position and this focus on some additional experience into our middle schools. Thank you. Okay, Any, anyone else? All right, we're gonna move on to, um, to we're gonna take this vote on the uh, personnel report, administrative appointment. I need a, yeah, that was our discussion. I need, a, we had our motion in our second. Now all that are in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Oh, that's right, you do have one more. Okay. I'll let you. Great, thank you. So, good, we do have three. At one time. No, we do have three appointments okay. that you all, you all just approved, so we'd like to take just a second to recognize them, and then a reminder they'll come back at a future meeting for a formal recognition in front of you. But first, I'd like to acknowledge um, Beth Bianchi, Beth certainly is a familiar face to most of you. She has uh, been a teacher here in Virginia Beach, began teaching here in 1997. She uh, taught at Newtown Elementary School, Trantwood Elementary School, Allenton Elementary School, served as an assistant principal at a donation center, also assistant principal at Burdenneck Elementary School, served for the, a long time as principal at John B. Dye Elementary School, decided to retire about a year ago today and uh, saw the error of her ways and has decided she'd like to come back full time. And um, this evening, we're really pleased that you accepted our uh, recommendation for her to serve as the next principal at Pembroke Elementary School. 
Also want to, yeah, congratulations to her. And welcome back. I uh, also want to uh, acknowledge Brianna Coburn. Uh, Brianna has served um, as a teacher here in Virginia Beach at Tallwood Elementary School, also in Norfolk Public Schools, most recently been serving as a school improvement specialist at Salem Middle School. And this evening, we're excited you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Larkspur Middle School. And then also would like to, yep, congratulations to her, sorry. And then also would like to recognize Emily Hitzman. Emily has served as a teacher um, since 2002 at Salem Middle School, most recently has been serving as an administrative assistant at Kimsville Middle School. We're pleased this evening that you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Corporate Landing Middle School. Congratulations to her as well. And that is all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are going to go to the school board committee assignments. We will bring, be bringing that back at our next meeting. Okay, so we, we took that off. Mrs. I'll, I'll make a motion on that. Yeah, we need to make that motion. Now you can make your motion. Now. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm gonna make a motion that we vote on the bylaw changes at our July 11th meeting, and then vote on committee assignments after we have voted on the bylaw vote. Um, whether or not it passes, it kind of depends on the committee assignments. But afterwards, uh, we want to vote on the uh, about the committee assignments for fiscal year 24, 2024. Yes. <laughs> for school, well, no, not school year. It's for fiscal year. Right. Um, from July one, actually, to June 30th of 2024. Second, and seconded by Ms. Brown. Discussion? Seeing none. Seeing none, uh, all that are in favor of bringing that back to the July 11th, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. That motion did pass. Thank you. We're now to the Virginia School, um, School Board Association VSBA re renewal. Um, the VSBA renewal, this is the um, deciding if we're gonna continue um, being on uh, a part of the VSBA. As you know, we, um, this is a entire board, um, recommendation where the whole board is a member. It's not individual. That is the requirements to be on the VSBA board. Um, Make the motion that we... So um, I need a motion. That we uh, participate in VSBA renewal. And do I second? have a second? Is there a second? Second from Ms. Uh, Franklin. Is there now, second? is there any discussion on this? Um, Ms. Franklin and then Ms. Brown, anybody else? Okay, Ms. Franklin. I do have a question because again, just similarly to the um, legislative committee, we haven't really been receiving any kind of feedback um, in regards to the VSBA. Um, I, I know that we get emails and stuff like that in terms of training and, and CE and stuff, but do, who is our current representative? Is that, is that you, Ms. Riggs, right now? Me. It yes. is. Are we going to be bringing um, another board member? Like we, uh, Miss Felton always was our VSBA person. Do do we have um, someone coming up that will be? I no one expressed the uh, want to be on that. Okay. So I mean, I can ask right now because we'll be bringing that back as well with the rest of the committees. Okay. So because no one expressed it, the desire, I decided to keep myself on it. Okay. All right, so that is something I mean, we've got. We need to have a representative, and a matter of fact, I need to have that turned in uh, in July. Okay, so maybe um, we could bring about some um, something that would just talk about the responsibilities and I, um, you know what you would do as that representative. Because I do, while I, I will vote for the, the VSBA um, renewal, um, I would like some feedback, some, something that is coming back from our membership there and make sure that we're getting um, our, our, you know, it's worth the membership. Well, I did bring back that um, the legislative uh, agenda back in, uh, I guess it was in 
March, February or March. I, I'm just saying that, I, that for for the for the amount, and I and I appreciate Ms. Tony Otto's and um, Ms. Lanetti's input about what what you all get from the membership. I appreciate that. Just from a board perspective, though, it'd be great if we would have more feedback from um, from our perspective as well um, for the for the membership fee. Thank you. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Okay. Have you been to any of the events yet? Um, the the first year I was, yeah. Yeah, and I, so we had several of our um, school board members, our new ones. I think uh, Mr. Callan, Ms. Brown, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Martin, all attended the um, January one, um, and they did report back to me. I don't know if they shared it with with any of you guys, um, and we can do that. Yeah, it, it would be it would just be nice to have some kind of report, you know, whenever. Um, we have something that comes up or, you know, just gets more feedback. And when we, I think there was, I attended, Mrs. Um, Anderson attended, Miss, I don't, Miss Melnick, did you attend the, um, the SBA conference in I did November? not because it was an election month and if I had lost my seat, I didn't want to use right. the taxpayers. Right, okay, so I think it was just, was just you, Mrs. Anderson and Liz, well, we, we were doing um, that attended. I think Carolyn Rye was there. Yeah, Carolyn Rye. Um, yeah, I think that's that's right. Okay. Usually we have. So much what I'll attendance. I am going to um, tell you now. If anybody is would like to be the representative for the VSBA, please let me know that as well in email. Okay, along with the other two, um, uh, the. PRC and the legislative, okay? If anybody wants to do that, yes. Um, with the VSBA, we need a um, representative and also an alternate. So Correct. we just wanted to put that out there that we do need two members on that. Yeah, and because Miss, um, I was the alternate, alternate, and Mrs. Felton uh, was not reelected, obviously, to the board, so I stepped up into her her oh. place. Okay. Ms. Fel Ms. Felton also attended in November. Yeah, she did. And and Madam Chair, does it include any travel? I thought there was some to Richmond and Charlottesville. Yes, actually, there is um, a there is there was a meeting in July that Miss uh, um, Tony Otto sent out. If anybody was interested in that. Yes, there is a Miss Martin is going to that. That is on July thirteenth. Thirteenth and. That is in Richmond. In Richmond. I can't attend because um, that is the night before I leave for Germany, so I'm not going to be able to go and be back. But Miss Martin um, is going to go. She is. She will be up there anyway. She's not going to be uh, using a room, you know, where we we need to pay for it or anything. So she already has her room, and she can. You can come back and share what you got from that. We, your mic's not on, hon. I was also planning on going to the September 21 legislative briefing in Chesterfield, and then they have the November conference, I believe, in Williamsburg. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we need to vote on that today. Ms. Brown. Ms. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Brown. I did see your hand. All right, so I want to take a moment to acknowledge a couple of concerns I have regarding the Virginia School Board Association. The VSBA has been known to take positions on controversial issues that may not align with the views of all school board members and the communities they represent. I also have deep concerns about the membership structure um, we just talked about, requiring the entire school board to join when the advocacy of the group does not align with the values of everyone's constituency. Along with the high cost of membership, attending training events is very expensive. However, I recognize there are individuals on this board that feel this membership offers valuable resources and opportunities for professional development, which is also required by state law. There's been a number of school board members that have indicated the value of the membership, along with the clerk and our division attorney. I am also aware of ongoing discussion regarding the desire for this board to consider removing professional development membership opportunities that present differing perspectives. I firmly believe that fostering an inclusive environment where multiple ideas and perspectives can be presented is essential to making informed decisions. 
It is important to remember that shutting down differing viewpoints goes against the principles of open dialogue and democratic processes, which is something I value. I'm going to vote in favor of this today, and I would like to clearly state that in the future, if the opportunity to gain diverse perspectives continues to be discussed for removal from other board members, that I would not be able to continue to support this membership going forward. Thank you. Anyone else oh, Madam. need to speak? Ms. Melnick? Um, at our governance meeting, we did discuss allowing additional um, professional development of choice by board members and that we had a budget. Um, perhaps we did not bring that little piece. We just, Mrs. Um, Riggs and I met with the clerks. We were talked about in PRC and governance about coming guidance and we, they, I know the budget, they, we explained the budget, there's money set aside for each of you. You can spend it on there. There's a form you'll fill out so there won't be any restriction as long as it's related to school board stuff. So we would, we were trying to plan out how you would how you would submit the information and how um, we would make sure you had enough money in your budget. Yeah. So you right now will not be restricted. You'll have a set amount. And then the goal was in planning your, your budget in the future to make sure you take an active role in saying, you know, I want to go to this type of conference so we set enough side money for you. So that procedure's already been working through. Mrs. Tony Ada created a form to make it easy for you to get it reimbursed. So that's going to be set in place and there won't be any restrictions other than it needs to be related to your school board work other than the set amount that each school member has. I'm sorry we didn't bring that conversation forward, but thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that will come at the next meeting. Yes, Ms. Tony Otto. And um, I, I think Ms. Uh, Ms. Lanetti said that that form will be going out to the school board members um, sometime after July 1. So there's two separate things. It's um, professional development and membership. So um, there is that, like they said, there is that opportunity to join um, other school board associations, which some of the members have already done. What would help us is if you can look at those organizations you want to be involved in, if you know what the expenses are for the upcoming year. So when we budget next year, we can make sure if they're, if you know they're going to have big conferences or something you want to go to, let us, uh, the clerk's office know so we budget enough money for you so we won't have issues. For us, it will be an issue of finding the money within the budget to make sure you have them go to the conference and things. We just need to know the plan. Any other concerns or discussion? Okay, so um, with no other discussions, concerns, I call for a vote to um, for the Virginia School Board Association renewal. All that in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. Okay, all that are against, please raise your hand. We have no nays. All that want to abstain, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, I'm abstaining because um, I'm a volunteer director of another school board organization called the School Board Member Alliance. And while I don't believe it's a conflict of interest, I would like to um, get an opportunity to get an opinion from the Commonwealth's attorney um, before I cast a vote on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manning. Okay, so Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes and one abstention, so the motion did pass. Thank you. Um, our last one on action is D, the salary resolution. Um, I call for a motion to approve the salary resolution for fiscal year 2023-24 and the following attachments as presented in the agenda packet. Attachment A, alphabetical listing of instructional positions. Um, attachment B, instructional experience base step, pay scale. 7 1 20, 2023 through 6 30 2024. Attachment C Unified Experience Based Step Pay Scale Grade Assignments 7 1 2023 through 6 30 2024. Attachment D Unified Experience Based Step Pay Scale 7 1 2023 through 6 30 2024. Attachment E Part Time Temporary Hourly rates 7 1 2023 20, through 6 30 2024. Attachment F, table of allowances 2023 20, through 2024. 20, Attachment G, high school department chairs and non athletic and the athletic supplements 2023 20, 24. Attachment H, student activity rates 2023 20, 24. Do I have a motion? Ms. Anderson, and do I have a second? 
and second by Ms. Franklin. And now I, will I think we want, there's a clear, I think they need to clarify what was handed out to you. There's a reason. Yeah, you, you received, as we were speaking on this uh, consent agenda from Mrs. Uh, Tony Otto, um, these attachments, and we'll have Ms. Woodhouse speak to that, and then I'll read the resolution. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The handouts that you have in front of you is to correct one uh, error that we saw in the documents. So if you um, take a look at the attachment C, grade assignment, you'll see the internal audit position under grade 20. That is where the internal audit position should be. And on the next page under U19, you will see internal auditor struck out. Um, it should be a U20 um, position. That was a position that came forward um, actually from a resolution from the school board earlier in the year, and we just missed it. And um, the same thing on attachment D, it's just moving the internal auditor position from the U19 to U20. And my apologies for that oversight. Thank you. Any questions on that? Okay. No questions. Thank you, Ms. Woodhouse, Thank you. for the clarification. Okay, so the resolution states, the salary resolution states, whereas the mission of the Virginia Beach City Public Schools, in partnership with our entire community, is to ensure that each student is empowered with the knowledge and skills necessary to meet the challenges of the future, and whereas the school board has adopted a comprehensive strategic plan and school improvement priorities to guide budgetary decisions and whereas the school board has studied the recommended school operating budget in view of state and federal requirements, additional demands for space and operations, the strategic plan, priorities, expectations, competitive ex compensation for employees, and the best educational interest of its students, and whereas the school board proposed operating budget has been reconciled to meet the funding from the city council and whereas the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 operating budget adjusts the instructional experience-based step pay scale to provide 1.5% between each step consistently throughout the structure without adjusting the entry rate and adds an experience step for all eligible, eligible employees on the scale per the recommendation of the division's compensation study consultants and whereas the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 operating budget adjusts the unified experience-based step by pay scale to provide a 1% adjustment for pay grades 0 through 14 and a 1.5% adjustment for pay grades 15 and above, and adds an experience step for all eligible employees on the scale per the recommendation of the division's compensation study consultants and whereas the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 operating budget establishes a new pay grade on the United Experience based step pay scale professional level two for behavior intervention specialists, school psychologists, occupational therapists, positive behavior intervention specialists, which is PBIS, physical therapists and school social workers per the recommendation of the division's compensation study consultants and whereas the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 operating budget upgrades identified positions currently on pay grade five of the United Experience Based Step Pay Scale, which includes bus assistants, cafeteria assistants, custodian one and fleet shop helper to pay grade seven, which is closer to meeting the $15 an hour Virginia minimum wage requirement by 2026, and realigns other positions impacted by said move per the recommendation of the division's compensation study consultants and whereas the instructional experience-based and unified experience-based step pay scales, part-time hourly rates table of allowances, high school department chairs, non-athletic supplements, athletic supplements, and student activity rates titled below. And as shown in the attachments are approved and will be effective as shown below. And whereas the percent of compensation increases and the effective dates of the increases are shown below. 
Attachment A, alphabetical listing of instructional positions. Attachment B, instructional experience-based step pay scale 7-1-2023 through 6-30-2024. Attachment C, unified experience-based step pay scale, grade assignments 7-1-2023 through 6-30-2024. Attachment D, unified experience-based step pay scale 7-1-2023 through 6-30-2024. Attachment E, part-time temporary hour, hourly rate 7-1-2023 through 6 30 2024. Attachment F, Table of Allowances 2023-2024. Attachment G, High School Department Chairs and Non-Athletic and Athletic Supplements 2023-24. Attachment H, Student Activity Rates 2023-24. Now therefore let it be resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach adopts the salary scales and the compensation increases as outlined in the resolution and attachments adopted by the school board this 27th day of June, 2023. All in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. So we are now on um, 16. Uh, we're going to do E. I forgot their ad hoc committee for the uh, Jericho Road. Ms. Weems. I move that the school board accept the chair's recommendation to create an ad hoc committee to study open space uses for school property on Jericho Road and to appoint Carolyn Weems as chair and Stacy Mark and Stacy Martin, school board member, to serve as the other school board member to the ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee and the ad hoc chair will have the powers set forth below in the document that you received um, in bylaw 128 and appendix C. Do we have a second? Ms. Martin. Okay, motion made by Mrs. Weems and second by Mrs. Martin. Is there any discussion on this ad hoc committee for Jericho Road? Seeing none, all that are in favor of this ad hoc committee, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. That's the end of the consent agenda. We are on 16 committee organization or board reports. Are there any? Okay, Ms. Martin. So I'll give a legislative committee update. Um, been in constant contact with Joel Andrus. We are just in a holding pattern because of the primaries and because of budget negotiations. Uh, budget negotiators were sent home today for the 4th of July holiday. We hope they reconvene mid-July and maybe we'll have a budget by the end of July. So that'll affect um, some of, of our future discussions. But I would like to remind school board members that I sent an email on May 23 um, asking for your input on legislative priorities. No one replied. Um, we have found some movement um, on some things that I did list here. Um, they won't require legislative changes. There'll be some administrative approaches um, to those things. So we already are seeing movement in terms of some workforce issues, uh, in particular the culinary certification, um, some possible movement on fast forward and dual enrollment. Um, so some of those things are still being sort of sorted out, but Joel will, um, will have another legislative committee meeting in early August, hopefully with a state budget passed, and then he would like to come brief the school board sometime after the school board, uh, the state budget passes so we can look at any impacts. Um, at that same time, probably we'll have a couple of back-to-back -back meetings as we figure out um, what some of the initiatives might be for the um, 2024 General Assembly session. So, thank you. Ms. Franklin? Thank you. Any, Ms. Franklin? I, so we've had several um, members of the community talk about the Yunkin proposed policies. And I'm just curious, do we have any clarity or movement on where we are on that in terms of, uh, yeah, I know that there was an input period, a public input period, and I'm just curious if there is Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Lennon. I, I don't know that it's official. I've been hearing unofficially it's expected by August, but I don't, we, we also heard May before, so I'm, not, I'm not sure when it's coming out exactly. Okay. 
It's been rumored. It's been rumored for all year. <laughs> it was November, but it's still <laughs> Okay. Um, any other committee reports? Okay. Um, being none, we are going to recess into um, oh, for ten minutes. Yeah, we're going to go back to our workshop. Remember, so, you do have closed for other reasons, too, mm -hmm. and there's some things After we do have workshop. to cover. Yeah, we're going to go back to, to the workshop. Um, we'll have a 10-minute break, recess, go back to our workshop, pick it up where we left off, which is the presentation for um, the gifted services update and also our forecast of regular school board meeting agenda topics for the fiscal year 24, the first quarter, July, August, and September. And then after that, we will have a closed session. And it will be, yeah, we are going to be going into the Einstein lab for all of that. So this portion of the meeting is adjourned.